Good morning, everybody. This is uh, Modern Optimization Methods in Python. Uh, about to do a Sci-Fi 2017. It should be a really good conference this year. Uh, I uh, we're going to talk the next uh, couple hours and and uh, do some hands-on kind of exercises. Uh, but if you care to do that uh, um, during the course of uh, this tutorial. <clears throat> the tutorial uh, is uh, pointed towards a recent trend of changes to uh, optimization methods and optimization. So optimization is something that's used in uh, all across all sciences and uh, Surprisingly enough, the, the tools uh, in optimization, the, the optimization tool stack uh, has been, uh, uh, I don't want to offend people, but uh, uh, it hasn't changed much in, since the computer first <laughs> came about. Uh, we were still using methods from the 60s uh, with some improvements up until a couple years ago. Uh, so there's been a, a shift towards parallel computing and uh, nonlinearity, uh, things that are um, uh, allow optimization problems to handle, to tackle uh, large scale physical engineering problems, chemistry problems. Uh, and uh, you don't see the, these methods uh, in textbooks quite yet, uh, except the most recent kind of textbooks, but uh, when you go back to a physics textbook or a quantum chemistry textbook, um, you'll still see many of the, the older methods from the, from the 60s. So uh, we're going to talk about some of these uh, modern methods. I'll, I'll go through a couple packages that uh, have optimization in it. So we'll start with, a, with an introduction to optimization, just uh, I'm going to assume people may have done it a few times but uh, are not totally familiar with it, so we'll get uh, the lingo down uh, and then we'll move into some of the more recent kind of uh, methods. Uh, let's see, so the package we're going to center on is Mystic, uh, which I'm the primary developer of. and. Um, uh, I hope everyone uh, was able to get, uh, so this is the uh, uh, tutorial homepage uh, and there's the notebook files and uh, there is a Python script here that you can run to make sure you have everything uh, installed. Let's see this uh, check env. Uh, and if that runs and doesn't complain about anything, uh, then you've got everything, you've got everything installed. Um, there's a few things like SQL Alchemy you don't have to install, but uh, it can make uh, the database backend stuff work uh, a little bit better. Um, okay, so everyone has that and if they uh, if they uh, if they don't it's not uh, terrible to install it all pip installs and um, uh, I saw on slack there was some conversation about whether this was uh, three Python 3 compatible or not and uh, uh, mystic is just recently Python 3 compatible so uh, it will work I converted the notebooks this, this week. Um, all right. Uh, so I'm, uh, I guess, start off. Uh, I'm Mike, Michael Kearns, and uh, the, um, uh, I basically have been an optimization, I'm a physicist, but I've been in optimization research and somewhat for 15 plus years. And, uh, I mean, one of the things that uh, was interesting to me is when I was first as a graduate student trying to kind of 
uh, do inverse modeling, or basically uh, look at, uh, um, say, uh, simulate, uh, I mean, this is the old days when, you know, there was no internet and dinosaurs walked the earth, right? That kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I simulated uh, uh, a, uh, a nonlinear absorption experiment and uh, I was running a nonlinear absorption experiment uh, to try to uh, determine <clears throat> how well uh, a nonlinear absorber would uh, absorb light, basically, to get the uh, transmission properties of it, nonlinear transmission properties. And uh, I, uh, you know, there was no internet, so I had to run a floppy disk back to my office. And this, you know, we're talking about a long time ago. And uh, <clears throat> I had uh, the simulation of the experiment and the data. And uh, I also had, uh, a little bit later, I started to do quantum chemistry on the material. And I wanted to try to extract trends and understand how the structure of the material, uh, what the structure of the material looked like. Uh, in It was suspended in liquid. It was, uh, kind of like a crystal, uh, molecular crystal. I was trying to understand what the structure looked like based on the absorption and transmission spectra and the, uh, the um, nonlinear transmission and the simulation of the experiment. And what I found was that uh, uh, the thing that was failing me was the ability to apply physical information to the inverse problem. Yes, it was a pain to hook up to, you know, a home-built computer that I had in my office that uh, was a, like a Beowulf cluster. Yes, it was a pain to get the data around uh, on a disk, but uh, the real failure that uh, took quite a long time was to be able to constrain things. Like, how do you constrain the, uh, how do you when, you, when you know something like an average bond length, how do you apply that as a constraint in the optimization problem to solve the structure. Uh, and there was just no way to do it. There was, basically, you had to leave out a lot of information. Uh, and uh, I, it was back then I realized, wow, the it's kind of an unknown thing, but the, uh, the optimization methods we have are, are really kind of basic and flawed. Uh, and uh, I mean, that's really when I started to convert my research over, even back as a graduate student, to focus on optimization methods. So it's, uh, it's something that's a little bit more budding now. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, first start with, um, can everybody see this okay? You need it bigger? You need it bigger? Okay, great. Uh, so we're going to start with uh, basic components of optimization. Um, <clears throat> optimization, uh, basically, you get the lingo for it, so people will call it the objective function or cost function. It's basically a function you're interested in. And there's a lot of things that you're going to do. With uh, optimization, uh, you tend to try to get to the bottom of something, so get to a, a minima, whether it's a local minima or a global minima. Optimization, you can picture uh, as there's some surface. The surface may be unknown. You may have a a function for it, you may have some information about it, and what you're trying to do is get to the lowest point on that surface, or the lowest point in some region of that surface. And uh, that's simply enough all of what optimization is about. Uh, when you do more complicated things, like uh, let's say optimization is used in regression, regression is fitting, right? Fitting uh, a, a line to data, well, what you're doing there is you're minimizing the distance, uh, but you're minimizing the difference between uh, the best fit line through the data and your data points. Okay, so that's, you have some metric, you have some metric which gives a measure of distance, you're trying to minimize the distance, and uh, so the optimization in, um, in uh, regression is basically, or fitting, is basically a minimization over the distance between <clears throat> the data points and uh, the line that you're drawing through the data points. 
And you can think of the same thing in classification for those of you who've done a little bit of machine learning. Uh, classification is essentially just splitting up a whole bunch of points uh, with a different label like uh, success and failure and you're trying to draw the best fit line that divides those two uh, groups uh, as, as best as you can to put all the success on one side and the failures on the other. And uh, the, the optimization problem there is to draw the, <coughs> the line that is the furthest away from each of the points on each side. So that's a maximization problem, but maximization is just take the energy surface and turn it upside down. And then you're doing a minimization. So that's, uh, optimization is basically everywhere along uh, all sort of uh, tools that uh, people are using. And uh, it all boils down to understanding what the potential energy surface is or the objective function is, the cost function, and uh, uh, trying to get to either a minima or uh, the global minima. So here's a standard type function we're going to define. Uh, it's a polynomial, uh, 1.3x squared times 4x plus 6. And then we have some optimizer. And the standard optimizer is uh, um, Nelder Mead. Uh, so here's uh, SciPy optimizes Nelder Mead. And um, uh, basically, what you'll see is the, um, the optimizer expects a cost function or an objective function to work on, and then it, object, uh, and then it expects uh, a vector, uh, so a solution vector. So uh, f min, or um, that's an elder mead, it's a, uh, it's a local steepest, it's a local uh, optimizer. So basically, if you have some sort of surface like this uh, potential energy surface of the um, polynomial, you pick a point. That point is represented by the three. You basically drop that line uh, point on the surface somewhere, and it rolls downhill, uh, which ultimately is basically what the you know simplified version of what Nelder Mead and any optimizer is is doing. There's a lot of local optimizers that just picture just having a, a a point on a surface, and it rolls down the rolls down the hill. So you get something that looks like that, you'd pick, uh, you'd pick a point like here, uh, I think, uh, pick a point like here, and it would roll down and find this point at the bottom. And it's actually much harder than you think uh, to, to find the true minimum. Uh, even if you have a parabola like this, you get a lot of optimizers that uh, they'll find points that are not exactly the, the true minima. And that can make a difference in your physical interpretation of, of what you have. You may not have the exact minima. And that's because uh, an, an optimizer has uh, built in things like uh, termination conditions, which tell, tell the optimizer when to stop. When does the gradient stop uh, changing uh, on the trajectory of the, the, the point moving down the surface? Uh, when does it stop changing by X amount? Uh, then the optimizer finishes. So those are the kind of things that are baked into optimization algorithms that uh, that uh, tell the optimizer when to stop. Okay, so typically we have something that looks like that. And uh, um, what you'll notice also is it's a, it's a uh, black box. An optimizer is one of those things that's a black box. I don't know if anybody has done optimization or machine learning. Essentially, what you get to do is you pick, uh, you pick an optimizer. Or in machine learning, you pick a model which has an optimizer uh, baked into the instance, and you say go, and uh, it holds on to the process until you're done, and it has an answer for you. And what happened in the meantime? You know, who knows? Are you at actually at the minimum? Also, who knows, right? Uh, so that is, uh, that's one of those things in, when you, when you can draw a picture like this, 
So you could say, well, yeah, that looks kind of like the, the minimum. That's not that bad. But let's say it was a 15-dimensional surface. Right? How can you tell from some resulting value? You see the value that comes out is x, and you print the value of x is minus 1.53, and that uh, right there looks like the minimum. But in a 15-dimensional surface, how do you how do you tell easily that you're at the bottom global minima somewhere, especially if it's very expensive to plot the surface, if plotting each point on the surface takes 20 hours, how do you know you're at the bottom? So those are the kind of questions that are actually really hard questions for most optimizers, and they're not even built to handle that. They just give you an answer. Right? They give you a point. Uh, so. Uh, even uh, those kind of things, to be able to look at the internals of the optimizer and see what's going on and understand what path it took and uh, whatnot uh, uh, can be improvements. Okay. So uh, here we uh, here we plotted our objective and our solution. Um, so one of the things that uh, people start to do to uh, op optimization tools provide, standard optimization tools provide, uh, in order to impose uh, physical information on the problem are called box constraints. And uh, what box constraints are is essentially uh, it says, hey, you have, uh, you have some inputs, but the inputs are only valid within this region, within this box. Uh, don't bother searching outside outside that box, and that helps constrain the space of the possible solutions that uh, the optimizer can explore. Uh, so most optimization algorithms are not constrained, and, and many of them can't even handle things like box constraints. Uh, so here's a <coughs> SciPy uh, optimize and uh, uh, minimize scalar, and there's a few of the methods uh, that uh, take bounds, so this one method bounded uh, takes a box uh, that we can work in. We're going to work in the region 2 to 4. So we're only going to look for uh, the minima between the region 2 and 4. And we'll look at the first order Bessel function. And uh, so again, what we have is uh, we call the optimizer on the first order Bessel function, and it's bounded between two and four, and this is still a one-dimensional optimization problem, so I can plot it very easily. Uh, and you can see here's the result, then when we plot the result, we get the point right here. So I was searching in the region between two and four, uh, and the minima is right there on the, uh, on the edge of the boundary. Okay. So uh, that is... Uh, that is one of the ways that, that so this, this region between four and seven wasn't even looked at by the optimizer. Um, and so that's uh, box constraints. Uh, <coughs> um, so uh, I will uh, flip over to Mystic for a second, is that uh, we're going to be working with um, uh, some, so Mystic has a bunch of nonlinear test functions that are built into it in the uh, model sub package. Uh, and uh, what they do is they, uh, so Mystic models, uh, it, you can pick any one of the, I don't know, has 20 or 30 um, test functions. Uh, Rosenbrock is one of the uh, standard simple kind of nonlinear test functions. Um, and uh, if you print the documentation, it gives you kind of what the, uh, the function looks like. And also, it tells you, hey, if you want to look at this function, uh, here's, here's the domain you should look at it to uh, see, see what the minimum is. Uh, here's the global minimum. And uh, so let's do that. Let's, here we look at the, uh, the documentation, we see it says to use the model plotter uh, between uh, minus 3 and 3 and uh, minus 1 and 5 
um, and uh, one uh, here. Um, still, it's a 2D uh, surface we're looking at, a 3D surface we're looking at for um, the Rosenbrock function, which has uh, the solutions at, at one everywhere. Uh, so model plotter, uh, this function's cheap to, um, to evaluate, so you can have a granularity that's pretty small. And if I uh, had done this from the command line instead of uh, trapped in the, uh, the uh, IPython window, you can actually spin the thing around. It's just a matplotlib plot of the surface. Um, and so that's what the thing looks like. And you can see that uh, it's basically got two wells. Uh, in this, now this is, um, this is in this slice of the Rosenbrock function. So 3D Rosenbrock uh, solution is one, 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 and this is a, a cut of the surface looking at the first two dimensions, and the third dimension is one. Uh, so Rosenbrock has a couple peaks like this. It's a nonlinear function. Um, and you can use that as a tool uh, in any of the problems that we're looking at. It always helps to get a good picture of what the what the, sol what the uh, surface you're going to be looking at is. Right, so um, here's kind of a, uh, a standard approach to uh, doing uh, an optimization problem is uh, what you'll do is uh, you take some initial guess, uh, and this is going to be a uh, 5D, uh, five-dimensional Rosenbrock, where the Answer should be one, 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 and one, uh, and one, uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, we do um, minimize Rosenbrock uh, starting at x zero, our initial guess, and we get a result. Uh, we can check uh, SciPy optimized gives us the number of function evaluations, um, and then we could do it again, uh, but this time. Uh, we're going to give more information. Uh, some optimization algorithms, if you provide the derivative of a function, uh, that helps. Uh, not many of op not many optim optimization algorithms can work with the derivative, but a few can. Uh, and if you provide the derivative, um, here Rosenbrock derivative uh, is the derivative, uh, then it may do better. Uh, we'll print the result again. Uh, and look at the function evaluations and uh, derivative evaluations. And then uh, what you see is uh, those are not one, right? The answer should be, the answer should be uh, all ones, uh, and it kind of fails um, in 5D. Uh, and, and again, because what we're doing is uh, opt minimize is just taking a point and just going descent down to the nearest well. And you can see in five dimensions with a whole bunch of spikes, it's gonna trail into one of the, it's gonna trail into one of the wells and, and get stuck. Uh, so, you know, how do you, how do you know? I mean, I got uh, the same answer essentially twice, one with the derivative and one without. And if uh, you went home and just said, okay, uh, I got it, uh, you'd be wrong, okay? and. Uh, you'd be in the wrong minima. So one of the things that uh, people do is uh, run the thing many, many, many times, right? And if it's a, uh, if it's a, a non-deterministic optimizer, uh, then uh, you can just run it several times within some bounds and it will just take a different random path. Or if it's a deterministic optimizer, one of the things you can do is uh, break up the uh, search space or randomize uh, the initial value you start at and uh, just keep going until you get uh, the best answer. Uh, so that's what we're going to do in this case. We're going to do a loop where we take uh, a bunch of random numbers and uh, we minimize the objective function with the derivative uh, and get the result. And we just happen to do a lot better and get it every time in that case. I wouldn't expect to get it every time, but uh, just that the 
fall of the random die in that case is we found the minimum every time. Um, essentially, all that is is basically like throwing a bunch of balls on the surface and hoping it gets close to the minima. Um, and if we didn't know that that was the minima, I mean, ultimately what people have tended to do over the course of the years is just say, I've gotten this number and no better in three days of trying. That's the answer, okay? Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that is actually, uh, you know, you, you'll see that kind of language masked in, uh, in publications, but that's what people do. They just give up and say, this is the best I got. I feel confident that it's the answer. Um, okay, so uh, another one of the things I want to talk about, another piece of the optimization problem is uh, the, what I would guess, the, uh, what I would call the um, traditional mechanism for imp uh, imposing information constraining information into the optimization problem. So and that's called the penalty function. And uh, so what a, what a penalty function is, is uh, I have a nice uh, equation, uh, equation up here. And uh, for some objective function, so you can think of some surface, uh, you're going to impose a penalty, add a perturbation to the surface. Okay, and that is some multiplier times some function. That's a perturbation to the surface. And essentially what you're doing with the penalty is saying when the penalty is violated, when this piece of information uh, like uh, the, uh, the mean of all the values are larger than four, uh, if that's violated, uh, it imposes a penalty on the surface and uh, increases essentially a barrier. So uh, what you get is you get, you know, you're trying to go to the minimum of a surface and the penalty function adds a additive barrier wherever the penalty fails, whenever the penalty, uh, it, whenever the constraint is not satisfied. So if you have something like this, minimize, uh, here's a two-dimensional problem, uh, 2x1, 2x0, x1 plus 2x minus x squared minus uh, 2 x1 squared subject to these constraints. Uh, there's two equations, x1 is greater than or equal to 1, and uh, x0, x cubed minus 1 is uh, equal to 0. And uh, typically for penalty functions and uh, constraints, uh, they're often written uh, with all of the, um, uh, all of the uh, uh, variables on the the left-hand side or the right-hand side, and they isolate uh, just uh, a value, usually zero. It's usually written so everything's on the one side and it equals zero or is greater than or less than zero. Uh, so, so what we're going to do is we're going to make a barrier where when these conditions are violated, it, uh, it's an additive value that helps push it away from those, uh, away from the region or the, where we have bad points. Um, so let's get that. Uh, here's our objective. Our objective function is uh, uh, looks, you know, thanks to NumPy, it looks uh, basically uh, just like our function we're going to maximize right there. Um, <clears throat> and in this case, uh, to help it along, uh, I am going to take the derivative since it's uh, very simple kind of analytical function, I take the derivative to help it along, uh, and that can be used. So minimize with the Jacobian or the derivative. Um, uh, and this method, uh, SLSQP, so uh, that's uh, linear and quadratic programming. Okay, so uh, one of the techniques uh, in, um, in most solvers uh, a type of solver, uh, linear and quadratic programming solvers, uh, work only on simple functions. They only work on linear or quadratic functions. They're going to estimate your objective to be linear or quadratics. Uh, and if you, if you can say, well, you know, I really have a high-dimensional nonlinear function, but it looks like a parabola, 
then, then you get the benefit of, uh, of, of using these things like penalty functions. So uh, what, if you want to apply information like subject to these constraints, uh, one of the approximations you have to live with is, okay, we have to treat my actual problem that I'm interested in, the function I'm interested in, like a parabola or a line. Right? So um, uh, to be able to, uh, to use these constraints, we're picking a, a quadratic, uh, quadratic programming. Uh, however, luckily enough, uh, I'm only working with something that's uh, basically in the realm of quadratic programming, so uh, it should be just fine. Um, uh, and then we do the usual thing, which is uh, basically uh, minimize uh, with that uh, quadratic programming uh, solver, and then we get a result, and that's unconstrained. Uh, and uh, for SciPy, uh, SciPy optimize, the uh, constrained um, optimizers uh, take uh, constraint functions in this kind of ugly form, uh, but uh, if you compare it to the, uh, the functions here, you could see uh, here's x naught cubed minus x1, which is this, this term right here, uh, and here's x1 minus 1 uh, here. Uh, this is classified as an inequality an equality, and this is classified as an inequality. Um, and uh, the way they have to be entered is you put everything on the, the uh, left-hand side, and uh, the inequalities have to be greater than or equal to. So if it was less than or equal to, I'd have to use negative values. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and then to make it easier to solve, uh, we even take the, uh, the derivatives of of those equations uh, to, to serve as, uh, to serve to better help assist us solve a problem. Uh, and then we solve it again where uh, what we have is um, there's constraints. Constraints is uh, cons, this uh, tuple of dictionaries okay, as our uh, constraints. Um, and uh, and you can see the first time unconstrained, it tries to tries to solve the problem, uh, and it gets a two and a one, which is uh, not not actually the answer. Um, and uh, the constrained optimization problem, uh, it tries to solve it, and it gets one and one, which which is the answer. Um, uh, so. Uh, it does better with the constraints, um, uh, but uh, it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit difficult to apply. And again, this is uh, okay in my case. I didn't have to make any approximations because my objective function here is uh, is uh, essentially a quadratic programming problem. Uh, if it wasn't, then um, uh, I have to approximate my objective typically. All right, so hopefully what that should do is start to introduce you to the standard methods in optimization uh, where uh, uh, many of them are. Now, I didn't go into, there are some, most optimizers have focused on being fast. Uh, being fast simply because they didn't have the technology behind them to do anything else but be fast. So if all you can do is approximate to a line, then the thing you're going to try to do is be faster than anyone else, right? Because who cares? You're not going to get the right answer. Anyway, I mean, and that's a perfectly valid domain. So I've uh, uh, done some contract work with uh, some of the big six banks, and uh, they don't necessarily care about predicting the stock market very well. Uh, they care about predicting the stock market very quickly. So it's linear approximations on uh, what the stock market is going to do in the next couple minutes or seconds or whatever, and kind of get a good idea of where the, the ship is going most likely, and then recalculate again. And you know, with an 
whole bunch of small segments that are linear segments. You can approximate any line, so that's what uh, it's essentially what they do, and they just try to be faster than everybody else. So they actually don't care about solving the problem very well. Uh, they care about solving the problem really quickly, and that's a big domain of optimization. Uh, however, for scientists, uh, you know, or people in engineering do, doing risk analytics, uh, it's a different story. So. You have limited data, you, you, you know, a problem takes several hours to calculate, uh, uh, you need uh, information. All right, so uh, I'm going to look at basically, um, here's a breadth of uh, kind of some of the optimization methods in, uh, in Sci-Fi Optimize, and it kind of gives you a sense of just what the, uh, the most common methods out, out there are, uh, and these are um, anywhere from traditional uh, early 60s optimization methods to, uh, to more modern methods uh, built in the last uh, 10, 10 or so years. Um, and what you'll notice is there's uh, the majority of them are unconstrained, uh, and the, the ones that are constrained uh, tend to be uh, linear and quadratic programming. So you have a balance between those two types. You have all these different, uh, different kind of regions. There's names you probably heard of before, like simulated annealing, um, and then constrained optimization. There's not as many of them. Uh, uh, there's things like uh, Coblia and uh, SLSQP. Okay, um, and and again, these are uh, you have a trade-off of using constraints versus um, not using constraints and getting a more nonlinear solver. Um, and there are other methods that I, I don't have up here, like uh, differential evolution and uh, genetic algorithms. Uh, but those are those are global solvers, uh, and uh, they tend to take a very long time. Uh, basically, they work by basin hopping, randomly pick points. Uh, you're at some point in a basin on a surface, and then you randomly pick a whole bunch of other points in some constrained algorithmic way, and it says, oh, this point is better. Now I move over to this point. You keep doing that until your termination condition ends up being something like, I haven't found a better point in 400 tries. I'm going to stop. Okay. Uh, and those uh, don't tend to do very well uh, unless you let them run very, very, very very, very long time. Uh, and then it's still not guaranteed that you'll end in the minima because most of the termination conditions end up being something like you haven't done any better in X amount of tries. Okay. So, um, so uh, what else? Here's, a, uh, here's an example uh, from uh, CVX Opt, which is uh, convex optimization that is, again, treating everything like, at, at best, a parabola. Uh, and what convex opt does is it gives you uh, some better tools than, um, uh, well, it's, it's essentially geared for uh, linear and quadratic problems. Uh, and uh, it's got some better tools uh, than site by optimize does for, for applying constraints and uh, looking into the optimization problem. Uh, so one of the things we see here is we're going to have this uh, objective function, and we want to subject it to uh, a whole bunch of these constraints, um, uh, a bunch of inequality constraints. So uh, to, to constrain an optimization problem with CVX opt, uh, you, you built a constraints, a constraints matrix. So you have uh, the equation A matrix A times X is B, okay? It's assuming it's going to be linear and quadratic, so it's AX equals B. And uh, your equations here are, here's a minus 1. That corresponds to this minus 0. Uh, so here's the, um, uh, the vector of the uh, X naughts, and here's the vector of the X ones, okay? So... This is, uh, it's, uh, 
looks like uh, uh, minus one, minus one, um, zero, and one. So CVX op looks for less than or equal to. Uh, this one's greater than or equal to, so we would have to flip the signs on it. So it's a, a minus one, that would be a minus one. Uh, X naught doesn't appear here, so it's zero, and this is a, a plus one. So that's what we get for, uh, for those coefficients of the X naughts. And here we have uh, one, minus one, uh, minus one, and uh, minus two. So those fill out our coefficients of the A matrix. Uh, B is the solution vector, so here you see one, two, zero, and four, but of course this one gets flipped, so it's minus two. Um, and, uh, uh, and then for our, our cost function, uh, we essentially are dealing with linear quadratic programming, so we have a <coughs> uh, just a matrix. We don't even give it a function. We say we're minimizing this function and we just give the coefficients. The coefficient is two and one, all right? And, and then Here's a linear programming solver for AX uh, times B, and you get your solution. Right, that seems like a lot of work to be able to just uh, solve, a, uh, fit uh, the values of X naught and uh, X1 in this linear function, uh, but the, the key piece is being able to get those constraints in. Um, and the nice thing about CVX opt is when it runs, uh, you get some of this diagnostic information. So actually the diagnostic information is great. Uh, what that allows you to see is, okay, it's not that I just got an answer, right? I just, I got an answer of uh, uh, X naught is 0.5 and uh, X1 is 1.5. Um, um, I actually can see how well the, how the optimizer moved. It, it, uh, it started out and then kind of uh, very quickly, within two steps, got around the uh, cost. So the, the cost is the energy cost. Uh, it's uh, the point on the uh, energy surface. Um, and, and it basically stayed around the minimum of this energy surface of uh, 0.25, 2.5. 2 um, so that, uh, that's one of the things that people who do optimization will love to see. What does the solution trajectory look like? How, how, how uh, uh, what's the value of the energy on the energy surface? So uh, the value of the uh, function, the objective function, as the optimizer is moved down the surface, and what are the, the, the values of the, the variables at those points? Well, this just actually just shows you um, the value of the uh, objective function at that point. Okay, so that, uh, that's more information. Um, here's uh, a quadratic case, uh, CVX opt again. Um, what, what, what it's gonna do is it's gonna build a, uh, it's gonna build a matrix of the uh, inequalities and a matrix of the equalities, and you get something that looks like, like this. It's essentially quadratic programming takes uh, uh, Q, which is, is this, uh, representation of our um, our objective function, uh, and then uh, uh, these guys G H and A B are the coefficients, just like we had before, for the inequalities and the equalities. Um, and uh, it uh, it's again treating it like a uh, quadratic programming problem. You're you're not going to be able to do anything more than uh, parabolas with these these things, and uh, you could see again nicely it uh, converges uh, to a solution. Uh, and 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 somebody who's done optimization problems, when you see a solution trajectory, uh, for most descent optimizers, what you're looking for is you're looking for it to kind of glide into the solution. If you see a glide into the solution, you think, okay, I have confidence that uh, that's done a good job. Yeah. Sure. Um, uh, so, 
let's see, we have uh, two, that's, it's X1, X2, X1, and uh, X2. Um, uh, these first ones are the, uh, terms, I believe. Uh, why is it a half? Um, right. Uh, let me see. Um, well, I have the two out front to do uh, the multiplication from the halves. Uh, so, okay, uh, the, uh, the thing that it's, it uh, is going to focus on is um, uh, these, are, these are coefficients for x1 and x2, and it's got to map out to the coefficients uh, up here. Um, uh, so this is, uh, the first one should be 2x1 <coughs> squared, I believe, and this one should be x2 squared. I'm multiplying by that, that by two. I don't remember why I did that. <laughs> uh, probably something to do with, uh, let's see. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, that's exactly what I was saying. Is the first part is specifying the uh, quadratic part, the squared terms, and the second part is the linear terms. And there's this cross term that we've got to deal with. Uh, so I, I forget the um, I forget the actual specification that uh, CVX op uses, but uh, uh, that's why I had to. It doesn't handle the cross term. But to handle the cross term, uh, I'm fudging those middle values at 0.5 and 0.5, and then multiplying by 2 to get the coefficients right. And that's just what it uh, specifies. So I don't remember exactly the, uh, you know, I can't tell you directly one to one. That's, that's, uh, but that's, that's what the documentation will say to do. The first part's the quadratic, the second part's the linear, and then handle the cross terms with the multiplier. So even, even in this case, you see it's hard to get some of these problems to, to, map, to, uh, to map to the solvers. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, let's see. So um, uh, it is nice to have this trajectory. Um, and uh, I'm actually, uh, I think, uh, I think I, I, I have exercises in here, but what, uh, what I think I'm going to do is I'm trying to time this. I'm trying to, trying to time this pretty well. And what I'll do is I'll hold off the exercises to the end of each section. And that way, people can do whichever bits they want. And we'll break up the uh, stuff. So we'll go and uh, skip to the, the next uh, bit. And remember, there's an exercise up there if you want it. Um, so I, uh, <clears throat> I look at, uh, now, what I've shown so far are basically local optimizers in general. But there are a few things that are global optimizers, base and hopping, differential evolution, genetic algorithms. Um, like I said, they do take a long time. And uh, uh, it's often very difficult for them to, uh, uh, the larger the problem, uh, the larger the uh, optimization problem, the higher dimensional the optimization problem is, uh, the more likely that these are going to be the solvers that will work for you. Uh, however, uh, they do take uh, quite a long time. You look at the number of function evaluations that we had in the previous problems, and uh, they were numbers like um, uh, 100, uh, 160, uh, almost 150. Uh, and then you go down and look at uh, 
uh, differential evolution, and you're seeing number of function evaluations like 40,000, okay? Um, and that's typically, uh, that's typically the case. So here's what we have. We have, uh, instead of picking an initial value, you pick uh, the range, some bounds that an initial guess is gonna be valid in. So again, we're looking at the Rosenbrock function. We're gonna do the Rosenbrock function in five dimensions. Uh, uh, optimization differential evolution, the Rosenbrock function, but instead of giving an initial value, you give uh, bounds, so valid between minus 10 uh, and 10. Uh, so that's the lower bound and that's the upper bound for all parameters, uh, and that gets passed in, and it sits there and churns for a while, and then gives you a result. Uh, and uh, it turns out that uh, the random starting values that it picked uh, it succeeded, uh, out of the 10 times we ran it, it succeeded nine times. Okay, and you could see, uh, you could see that the one indicator that it failed in this particular case is the function evaluations are much less. Essentially what happens is it hopped around and it didn't find a better solution and it stopped, uh, while uh, the ones that uh, got to the best solution what you've got is uh, the hops are not across the entire uh, area. Uh, that's part of these algorithms is uh, once you start to get on a path, it often narrows the, it narrows the range that it hops to or narrows the range that the solution trajectory mutates to. Uh, so you'll end up seeing something like these large number of function evaluations because it's, it's found it and then it uh, is hopping around in one of these basins quite a bit and improving just very slightly. Um, uh, and it just, uh, you get this glide behavior down to a best solution. So if you were to look at the solution trajectory, you'd see it kind of got where it was going pretty quickly and then maybe chunked down a few times like that and ended up just gliding, gliding out until it eventually stopped. Uh, so that's one of the difficult parts about that is uh, let's say you have uh, an objective function that takes five hours to evaluate. Differential evolution uh, is not going to be your friend, you know, or any of the global methods uh, that have these kind of function evaluations. That uh, is longer than I want to wait for it. Um, all right. Yeah, of course. No, it's minus 10 and 10, and what I, what I did there is I just uh, took the list and multiplied the list by five, which means it's gonna be minus 10 and 10 for each, uh, for each of the uh, parameters. So it's a five-dimensional optimization problem. All right, so that's, uh, that's one of the cases, and it's, uh, again, a difficult uh, issue with global optimization is that they tend to take a long time uh, cost, they, they're very costly. Um, I mean, one of the obvious things that people have done is uh, they started to parallelize these uh, global optimization methods to try to, to try to speed things up a little bit. All right, so there's some other uh, cases that are worth noting, um, and I'm just gonna brush through them real quick. If you want an error estimate built in, typically uh, you would use uh, least squared fitting. So least squared fitting uh, is this line right there. It looks basically like um, curve fit of your function uh, starting at some initial guess. Uh, and what you're trying to do is uh, fit uh, X to your noisy uh, data. So what I've done is I've, I've built a function here uh, and what you're trying to do with uh, the curve fit in the, in the case is uh, fit the parameters uh, A, B, F, and phi inside of this objective. Um, and so it's slightly different than the other uh, optimizers and uh, the only reason uh, you tend to use it as uh, uh, fitting the curve and uh, getting the covariance out, which is an error estimate. Uh, and you can do that um, 
uh, by uh, what the uh, least squared fit function typically returns is it returns the estimated parameter values uh, and it returns the covariance or the error estimate values. Um, otherwise, there's no need to use uh, least squared fit unless you want to get this uh, error estimate baked in. So that's covariance and it, with all of these guys being around zero, it tells us that, okay, the, the fit was pretty good. And you know, you could see if these were my target parameters uh, and these are the values I found, um, they match up pretty well. Uh, and you can see there's not much of an issue. Uh, so that's one of the techniques and uh, that's pretty much contained within the uh, least squared fitting. Uh, most other optimizers don't give you most other optimization algorithms don't give you a, a, a covariance, uh, basically. Um, so that's a pretty rare diagnostic technique. Now, uh, I'm <clears throat> there's another uh, kind of interesting case, which is integer programming, which is used in uh, uh, working over discrete sets. So integer programming is, again, a specialized, a specialized solver where the solver only works on the space of integers. So uh, that's used in cryptography and optimizations research and a few things like that, uh, where a uh, solver doesn't work over the state of reals, it works over the, the, the set of integers and you have to map your problem onto an integer problem, basically. Um, and they can have constrained integers, so constraints tend to work in those. Uh, integer programming problems, uh, just like linear and quadratic prob problems do. Uh, I, I'm just gonna note that that's there. There's a number of solvers, like Google has a solver toolkit for that. Uh, doesn't necessarily have the Python interface, but uh, um, we will deal with it uh, a little bit later. All right, so typical, uh, typical uses for, <coughs> for optimization are Minimizing a function, fitting data, uh, finding roots. So I showed the other two above. Um, root finding uh, will look something like that. You uh, get a system of equations. Uh, you have uh, A, B, and C, which are the coefficients we're trying to find, uh, and uh, x0, x1, and x2, which are the, the uh, uh, parameter vectors. And then we write a system of equations uh, where we essentially have a value on the left-hand side and the right-hand side is equal zero. Okay, so the idea is you have uh, a list of, of three values uh, where that's the left-hand side of the equation and the right-hand side is equal to zero. And what you're going to try to do is minimize uh, the, the summed value of the equations. And that's, uh, that's typically how those work. Uh, so it will, um, uh, you, you, you'll start with these coefficients, these uh, A, B, and C. Uh, we get an initial guess of uh, uh, minus one, minus one, sorry, point one, point one, and minus point one, uh, and then root of our system of equations from this initial guess with these coefficients. Uh, and the result you get is the new values of our of our x vector, our solution vector. Uh, and again, what it's trying to do is it's just trying to minimize uh, the summed value of the equation. So it uses uh, some metric, and the metric of distance is how those equations are summed. Uh, do we sum, you know, sum squared of all of those values when they equal zero, then, then we're done. So that's, uh, that's root finding. And that's the typical way of doing root finding. Um, all right, uh, and uh, uh, parameter estimation. Uh, so there's uh, there's uh, polyfit, and uh, I'm just going to leave that uh, for us to look at a little bit later uh, on your own. Um, okay, so what have we talked about? basically a lay of the land for optimizers, uh, different techniques for um, uh, optimization, constrained, unconstrained, uh, some of the dis special cases, uh, we 
talked about global and uh, local optimization, and have ho hopefully uh, made you familiar a little bit with the pain points. And, and this I want to bring back as our standard diagnostic tools. So, you know, what you'll see here, uh, what you see above, basically, that we've just went through, are really, uh, you know, for, for the last 50 years, what people have dealt with in doing optimization problems. And the, the thing I want to point out is how, how do you understand that you've found the answer? Uh, the answer is, uh, these are the standard ways. You, you, you look at it by your eye, basically. You plot the solution, slices of the solution. You, you try to understand, yes, from the, what I can plot, uh, it looks like I'm at the bottom. Uh, you run it several times, take the best result. Uh, if you're lucky enough to get a log of the solution vectors or a printout of the solution vectors, you kind of trace the convergence of the solution vectors and say, yeah, that kind of <laughs> feels right. And uh, if you're lucky, you might get the uh, covariance matrix. But how can you really be sure uh, you have the results you're looking for? So that's uh, one of the issues in optimization. And it's really, uh, in many cases, because of that, it's more of an art form than a, than a science. Just like uh, experimental science is, you know, you have, to, you have an instrument and you have to kind of tune the instrument. You, you get the instrument to run and you tune the instrument a little bit and the you get more power and you get uh, a better focus and you kind of tune it, tune it, tune it. And when is it good enough to get the results? When is it actually performing as it should? Well, you just know it is. Uh, or you give up and say, uh, this is the best I'm going to get. I'm going to take my results, right? I mean, and that's essentially uh, most optimizers are, are, are built like that. They are essentially a black box instrument of, of theory. Um, and uh, I think we can do better than that. All right, so uh, that's the end of this first section. Uh, there's uh, three, uh, three exercises in it that uh, if, you, if you choose to do them, uh, uh, you, can, you can try. So what uh, I'm basically going to do is go let you work on the exercises. Do people want to do exercises? I mean, if, if people are universally opposed to doing exercises, we'll just skip them. But uh, people want to do them or, or not? Yeah. OK, that looks, that looks good. OK, so take uh, 15, 20 minutes or so and uh, try to address uh, these exercises. I'll sit here and do the same thing myself and uh, uh, come around. And if you have questions, ask. Uh, I, I'm, Planning on, uh, you can take a break now during the exercises if you like. Uh, I'm also going to fit in a scheduled break for 15 minutes at 10:15, uh, right before they take the snacks away. All right. So was that uh, enough time to kind of get your feet wet on those things? Uh, hopefully, I mean, these problems are quick. They should be able to should be able to get maybe one of them. Um, I think. Uh, uh, based on uh, the timing we're going to go through here, what I'll just do is um, I'll uh, I'll post the post the solutions for the exercise up on the on the uh, uh, website after after the class. Uh, that way, if it's not enough time for people to to get through all of them, they still want to work through what they can, and the solutions will be uh, right there for you. I can, I can even, uh, I have them in one form, but I can put them in, in the several other forms. So is there questions that people have on, on these? Uh, was it actually this, this first problem with uh, three, um, uh, three um, inequality constraints? Um, people use CVX opt on that. So uh, that's, um, and, and how many people did the sci-fi optimize with uh, strawberries? Yeah. So the people tend to use uh, CVX opt uh, for these things. Uh, it, it, it actually tends to be faster. It works with inequalities pretty well. However, it's a much more limited, uh, well, 
they're all fairly limited, uh, but uh, CVA, it's still kind of clunky to work with these, and that's kind of what I wanted you to get the feel of more than anything else. Uh, uh, we're not going to dwell too much on these. Uh, we're going to flip over to start using Mystic, where uh, life is a little happier. I tend to use it in real life. Uh, so let me let me say let me say this: if you are in industry uh, and uh, you need to get a very fast answer, you're not going to use CVXOPT. Uh, you are going to use Gurabi, uh, which does exactly the same thing as CVXOPT does, uh, but you have to pay through the nose for it. Uh, and if you're in the, you know, in the position where you're trying to do linear and quadratic programming uh, and you need a fast answer, that you'll use that. Uh, if you're a researcher, and maybe you don't have the money to spend on uh, uh, Gurabi, um, which is a commercial product, uh, then, uh, yeah, we, people use CVXOPT in, in, in real life, not in the classroom. I mean, this is, uh, so this is basically, um, you know, even for these problems, you start to see things that are, that are a bit difficult. I don't know, you've, uh, these problems are also not, um, they're a bit leading too, and that uh, I've made it so they all work with uh, coefficients. What happens if you have a sign, right? One of your constraints has a sign in it. What then do you do? Well, then you're actually forced to not use CVXOPT, or else you're forced to make uh, a problem that is an approximate. Uh, so, so in that case, if you have a sign, then okay, you're in the realm of now possibly working with. Uh, 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 SciPy and uh, having this um, having this uh, form here, uh, but uh, that doesn't work terribly well either because this uh, this is this is your equation, right? So there it would work with a sign. It would work with having the constraints equation and potentially the the derivative of it. But uh, I mean that's part. I, like I said, I'll post the exercises after the class, but uh, exercise solutions after the class, but I just wanted to get you feeling a little bit of the pain of, uh, of doing it, and, uh, and, and that's really what it is. Um, uh, if it was easy, then we would understand a lot more about the world. So the first, uh, the first uh, solution uh, by the way, if uh, for those people who, that was the only one that the uh, the numbers weren't posted for, and I, it's uh, ten and minus three. Just for those of you who, uh, which, just uh, for your own instant gratification, if you had solved it, it's uh, ten and minus three, um, uh, and uh, the other ones, the solutions are. The solution values are in the documentation, like this one down here. It's seven and two. But I will. Uh, uh, people have questions about uh, working on those. Uh, so did that populate any questions up to to you that you wanted to ask before we move on to the, the next section? Okay. Um. Uh, so. So again, I, I, I have a thing. Uh, what happens when you go to high dimensional and uh, high dimensional optimization, nonlinear constraints? Uh, what does the world become for you? And uh, I mean, basically, this was uh, what prompted me uh, <clears throat> about 15 years ago to start uh, working on Mystic. And I was one of the first people to uh, go into uh, this portion of the field, um, and uh, Mystic's been around a long time. It's been around for 15 years, and uh, uh, or 12, 12 years, something like that. Uh, it's not just my research that's gone into it, but uh, it's it's grown, and there's been other people that have contributed to it, and uh, it's uh, taken on a lot of uh, modern uh, modern optimization techniques that have blossomed in the last uh, couple years, but uh, the one thing uh, 
one thing initially about Mystic was uh, we want to be able to see inside the black box. We want to be able to uh, have more tools, uh, take optimization to a object-oriented kind of white box as opposed to a black box uh, so we can kind of uh, customize the optimizer, swap in parts that better approximate our problem and uh, have better diagnostics. And ultimately, um, uh, about ten, eight, eight years ago, uh, I, I was the first person to uh, be able to uh, apply um, these uh, new kind of uh, constrained optimization methods. But it, for people who've done machine learning or tried machine learning, essentially it's a kernel transformation. I don't know if you know really what a kernel transformation is. A uh, kernel transformation is a, a mapping. Uh, so how many people have a uh, math, math background, uh, basis sets, kind of like that, right? Uh, and uh, on the other side, physics, quantum mechanics, right? So in machine learning, kernel transformation is a uh, transformation of space from one space to the next, okay? It's uh, taking a space and mapping it to another space. That kernel transformation is transforming one space to another. That could be a coordinate transformation. Uh, it could be a filtering where you uh, reduce the, the space down to the regions, to the uh, directions of space that have the highest variance, okay? But it's a, it's a transformation. So in quantum mechanics or, or physics, uh, you think of it as an operator, applying an operator to transform one space to another space, and you have the mapping of that space with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And that's applying a inf piece of information. Uh, you know, you think of the classic Schrodinger's cat kind of thing, right? Is the cat dead or alive? It's both dead and alive, and you do an observation, and that observation's a new piece of information, and that collapses your wave function to be, yes, uh, we have a dead cat, okay? Uh, now, uh, with that piece of information, we shouldn't be trying to find solutions when we have a live cat. Uh, so that's what a kernel transformation does. It's a mapping of sp spaces from one to the other where we're applying some new piece of information and reducing the search space. Uh, you get eigenvalues and eigenvectors. out. That's common in a lot of type of physics, quantum mechanics problems. And essentially, uh, new generation of uh, optimization, and I'm one of the, probably the person who started it was uh, to, uh, uh, to apply this kind of technique to <coughs> apply information in optimization problems. So we were doing it with penalties and box constraints and kind of poor approximations, but uh, uh, we can do that with, uh, with operators or kernel transformations. So we'll we'll talk about that in this uh, in this section. Um, so if we look at Mystic, uh, a uh, introduction to Mystic will show you that um, uh, it uh, it meets the Python standard. Uh, if you like the uh, SciPy optimize one liner, uh, you have uh, fmin from Mystic uh, and all the same kind of keywords. So if you've learned SciPy Optimize and you've learned SciPy Optimize's one-liners, you can directly use Mystic uh, as well. And all Mystic will have is a, a couple extra keywords that allow configurability. Now Mystic has a, an actual object-oriented interface to it that we'll see later. But uh, as a start, if you've learned uh, SciPy Optimize, then you can directly start to use Mystic as well. Um, and you can see in this case, uh, it's our friend the Rosenbrock function. We're going to go in uh, three dimensions. There's uh, our initial guess. Um, and uh, here, uh, ret all ret is the keyword that Sci SciPy also uses retain everything, retain all the solution vectors. Um, and uh, uh, and what that does is it, instead of just returning the, the result, it, you return a tuple of a whole bunch of, of things, uh, the last thing being 
uh, all of the solution vectors. Um, so uh, what you can do is then like do a plot of each of the parameters within the solution vectors and you get something that looks like this. So this is a uh, um, number of uh, iterations versus the parameter value. And you can see the optimizer started with the initial values and it kind of converged to all ones eventually, okay, which is the solution of the Rosenbrock. Um, so that's, you can do exactly the same thing with sci-fi optimize. Um, uh, Mystic tries to make this easier, so that's nice to be able to look at the solution trajectories, and this gives you some confidence that, yes, I did at least converge uh, and not have some weird abrupt thing just stop me. Uh, so you should have, uh, as, as, as an operator of an optimization uh, package or an optimization algorithm, uh, you know, you like to see these smooth convergences and not abrupt stops, so that should give you some confidence it's good, and the only thing you'd worry about is, am I converging to the right minima? We know the answer already, so the answer is yes, because it's one, 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 but uh, that's, a, that's a nice diagnostic. Um, Mystic actually gives you the ability to uh, apply callbacks. Uh, so in this case, we're gonna be doing the same problem, and uh, I have, uh, again, not, not as easy to do in the, uh, uh, notebook here, but uh, um, so this is uh, run pretty well if you do it from the command line, but uh, uh, gives you the ability to, uh, we have this uh, plot parameters function uh, where we're just plotting, uh, pr uh, giving a current plot of the existing parameters, and um, I do an fmin and I give a callback and that's plot parameters. And so what that's gonna do is, you wouldn't see it if you ran it in a notebook, but if you run it outside the notebook, uh, it'll actually do a, a plot of the solution at every new value. So you'd see a plot and uh, this, uh, this plot at the bottom is dynamically drawn where the, the values get etched out as long as it's tracing along. You put whatever callback function you like in there, as long as the callback uh, uh, follows this, it basically takes the, uh, the parameter vector as the input. So if it takes the parameter vector as the input, you can do whatever you need as a, as a callback function. And uh, so this one, dynamically drawn plot, I actually don't use very much. Uh, I tend to uh, uh, have, if I use a callback or I'll use a log or something like that, I want it to log to a, a file, or I want it to do something like that, where then I can go and you know, plot from the file. But uh, this is just an example. Um, and uh, this uh, handler over here, handler is true. Uh, what that does is, um, uh, if you set handler to true, uh, what you get to do is stop an optimization problem. Okay, so one of the things that's a big issue is let's say you know you're running an optimization problem and you know uh, the thing might take might take a day and uh, you you've had it run 18 hours uh, you have zero diagnostics back from it and you looks like even if you do have diagnostics from it maybe the solution looks good and you feel all right that's enough I want to stop or maybe you feel like uh, uh, I need to shut the computer down, I, whatever it is, you need to stop. And the problem is in, if, if you don't, if you're, if you're not able to get the diagnostic information back, uh, you're done. You, you have to shut it down, you lose everything. Ultimately in most solvers, most optimization algorithms, because it's a black box, it's a functor, that uh, you don't get anything back until you get the result, you're toast. So uh, by having a handler, what that allows you to do is it allows you to do uh, control C to do an interrupt and then interrogate the solver a little bit. Um, and that's only used if you don't plan on working interactively with the solver. I'll, I'll show a little bit later. Mystic has a, uh, the ability to walk step by step through a solver so you can uh, 
actually manually control how many steps and 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 whatnot. But uh, if you run into a function that's uh, that's uh, blocking until the end, like most optimizers are, uh, there's nothing you can do to stop them. And, and Mista gives you a handler, which allows you to stop and say, what's the current best value? Uh, apply a callback function to try to get some results, interrogate it a little bit, and then uh, continue or, or stop. Uh, so while that's kind of useful, um, it's another one of those things that I used a lot initially, but uh, uh, with better tools, uh, have have put it to the side quite a bit. Um, but it's often one of those things that uh, when you don't apply the handler and you've got the thing running and you run into the case where you want to stop the thing and you haven't started it uh, with the handler in, uh, you wish you had. Uh, it basically costs you nothing. It just allows you to do control C and, and uh, temporarily stop. All right. So um, uh, here's uh, here's another case where uh, uh, I'm applying a callback that does print parameters, and you can see in print parameters, what I'm going to do is just say generation blah has best fit parameters of of something. So uh, what I have is a global iteration counter, and uh, every time the callback is called, it uh, it uh, increases the iteration counter and it prints out the current value of the parameters. And that way, um, even if the optimization algorithm doesn't have, and this is what CV, CVX opt is doing internally too, is it's just got a callback function that, that prints the current value of the parameters or something like that. So here's, here's what you get out of it with the callback, uh, printing the current value of the parameters. Uh, and you could see this way that they, Converge pretty well. I mean, you start up here right at the second iteration. You're almost at a good solution, and by the time you're down at uh, the seventh one, halfway down, uh, you're pretty good. Um, and so that's uh, that's a little bit more diagnostic information to put that kind of callback in. Um, but Mystic provides the ability, so you don't have to rely on building your own callback functions. So this uh, this kind of printing the parameters. Um, it gives you uh, what I call monitors. And uh, there's several different kinds of monitors. One is a verbose logging monitor. <clears throat> uh, and what a verbose logging monitor does is it basically prints uh, information to standard out uh, as well as creates a log, a log file. Okay? Uh, and we're, we're capturing, capturing solution trajectories, basically. So that's our... Uh, internal diagnostic information into the optimizer. How's the optimizer doing? You look at the the information that comes from the solution trajectories. And the verbose logging monitor is a class. Uh, it's a class object. And uh, what we have from it is um, the number of times we want to print uh, the energy value, the uh, representation of what the energy is on the surface. So this sh this thing should be going down to the minimum, which is zero in this case. Uh, so here we can monitor uh, the kind of from a stream pictorially uh, from this log what the value, instead of the values of the trajectories, uh, what the value of the kind of the point is on the surface and the energy value on that surface. So the initial guess started up pretty high at like 300 and it quickly drops down to about zero. and you see that uh, you ultimately end up at zero. Um, and uh, that's hooked up by just saying, I want an iteration monitor. Uh, so if you wanted to capture all of the function evaluations, uh, you'd hook up an eval monitor, a function evaluation monitor. But if you want to just capture uh, the best value as the optimizer goes to the next iteration, you hook up uh, an iteron. They're the, the same object. They're just capturing different uh, different things. The uh, evalmon, uh, the um, evaluation function evaluation monitor, uh, will grow to much bigger sizes because you end up doing more function evaluations than than an iteration monitor. So the iteration monitors for the 
solution trajectories. Uh, and this is, uh, there's several fields here. So the first two fields are uh, print the Y information, essentially print the surface information to the screen and to a file. Okay, and uh, you can toggle those independently. Uh, parameters like three and four, which I'm not showing there, are print the X values as well. What are the solution trajectory values? Uh, and save those. Uh, and so what you see with Mystic is one of the things that uh, Mystic prints is not only is it easy to hook up the monitors to it, but it has um, <coughs> a very clear print of what the termination condition is. I stopped by meeting these conditions. And we'll come back to that later because Mystic's gonna give us the ability to change, uh, change and customize our termination conditions. Uh, and, and what this did is uh, it printed a log by default called log.txt, but you can call it whatever you like. And, and Mystic gives you a log reader. Again, both uh, Mystic log reader.py as a, as a script or uh, as a function, Mystic log reader. Uh, and uh, it gives you uh, a plot of the solution trajectories that come out of this log file. Uh, and this is the cost function. So this is the X values and that's the Y values. And you can see this looks like a very happily converging solution. The cost uh, tails off. Uh, the, the parameters converge pretty well. It's kind of a uh, plotting in, uh, plotting using a, a steepest descent or a linear optimizer tends to look kind of clunky a little bit in that uh, it only takes 14 iterations, so you're not gonna get smooth lines, but uh, that's basically nice. Uh, you get a good. Uh, this is the standard analysis you'd see of uh, of optimization convergence, both with parameters and the cost. So that's uh, that's available out of the log reader. Um, and uh, here is uh, uh, and again, I should have I should have made this a little bit more interactive. But uh, if you uh, do the model plotter and you give log.txt, uh, you can't really see it very well, but uh, if I was able to spin this around, I could. You'd see that the solution trajectory is, is uh, printed uh, right here. The initial value started here, and you can kind of see it. It goes down the back and, and to, the, to the minima. So if I could spin this thing around, uh, you'd, see, uh, you'd see that uh, that was the case. Um, sorry. Uh, so one of the things, but now that's uh, that gives you more insight into what's going on in the in the optimizer. And uh, like I said, Mystic is trying to be very customizable, so you can uh, basically when an optimization algorithm is built, it, it's built for a certain class of problems, right? So you you. Uh, you have all of the optimization algorithms were designed for a particular class of problems. And things like the termination conditions, uh, which is when the, the optimizer should stop, or uh, that is customized to work for the majority of that class of problems. If you don't know what class of problems the optimizer uh, is intended for, or you don't have something that fits to that class, you're essentially just applying an optimization method, and maybe the termination conditions aren't that great for you, so you just try a bunch of different uh, algorithms. But what uh, Mystic says is, well, I actually don't want to have to pick an optimization algorithm and have the termination c condition come along with it. I want to be able to, to customize that. So we'll look at a differential evolution solver that I typically use for global optimization. And uh, um, what we're going to do is look at Mystic's uh, class-based interface. So Mystic uh, uh, says all the different pieces of the optimization algorithms uh, can show up as objects. Uh, here is the termination condition, VTR, uh, which is essentially stop when you hit this point. Um, uh, there's a uh, uh, mutation strategy, uh, best one, X, so takes the best one uh, and uh, out of, well, I mean, just 
there's a lot of different strategies. This is picking the best one in terms of mutation and how it uh, goes forward. Uh, we'll pick a verbose monitor and um, uh, then if we go down to the interface, uh, we're going to do uh, nine dimensional Chebyshev polynomial and we'll try to fit using differential evolution uh, with the bounds of minus 100 and 100 on each parameter. Uh, put in a verbose monitor uh, where it's going to plot every 50th cost so that kind of shows you where it's at every 50 iterations. Uh, and here's the Here's some of the things that you see from Mystic's uh, interface is uh, instead of using the, now I tend to, I tend to actually typically use the one-liner interface unless there's something I can't do out of the one-liner interface. And then you, then you can come in to the multi-line interface for more customization. Uh, but uh, pick the differential evolution solver on a nine-dimensional, dimensional problem and we have uh, a population. So uh, differential evolution essentially says um, I'm going to try in this case 90 uh, potential solutions and then pick the best one of those 90 potential solutions and then go forward and then pick the best one of those 90 potential solutions and keep going forward until for after uh, some time it uh, doesn't find a better solution. Uh, so with Mystic, you can also uh, do something like this, which is set the initial values. Uh, so <clears throat> you can either uh, pick the initial points or you can randomly pick the initial points within some bounds using, uh, I believe, I believe that's uniform. I would have to, I don't remember. I would have to look at the documentation. Uh, uh, but also um, there's a set sample initial points uh, which basically allows you to pick from any known distribution your initial points. Um, but so there's a lot of different ways that you can start with some initial values, either a point. So I could do differential evolution and have all of them start from a single, uh, a single point, which actually is not a smart thing to do. You might think it is, but it's, it's not a smart thing to do because uh, they work on uh, differential, ev differential evolution works on mutation of the solution. So it's going to start with one solution and then copy that out to uh, 90 times and then work off mutations of that solution to try to find the best value. It's essentially a very contained random problem to start with. What you want is a lot of randomness to start with, uh, randomly chosen values, and then work from the best one or, or, or two of those. All right, so uh, there I'm applying a iteration monitor. Uh, so this is going to, again, not capture the function evaluations, but capture the uh, iterations. Uh, I'm enabling the handler again. Let me turn it off and, and, and uh, stop. Uh, and then I do solve. Now, solve is essentially the blocking mechanism that uh, when we run it, it's going to run until uh, it gets a result unless I stop it with the signal handler. Uh, and then I want to get the solution out. I can say, give me the parameters, the, the solution. Um, all right, so, uh, and this thing kind of runs, and here you see it prints every 50, uh, 50 values. It gives the cost. It's gotten down towards zero, which is good, which is a good fit to the, uh, here's the actual, Chebyshev uh, polynomial for nine coefficients, and uh, here's the value it it fit to. That that's pretty decent, um, and uh, here's the plot of the fitted versus the exact result. Okay, so um, now one of the things that I'm not getting into that's uh, not obvious here is uh, you have a solver instance. You have a solver instance. And the solver instance has a lot of things like population. So um, when you do solve, when you're done, you have the final population. Uh, you have uh, all of the iterations, the trajectories that are available that you can look at. There's functions that allow you to get them pulled out, but they're actually 
contained within the solver. So you can go in and, and interrogate those, and there's functions to go in and interrogate those, but they're, they're essentially attributes of a class. And the, the solver maintains its, its state. Uh, so if you have one of these things that you stop, uh, Mystic gives you the ability to restart a solver from where it stopped without any loss of information. Uh, so uh, what that allows you to do is um, do a convergence to a solution, change the termination condition, uh, change some of the constraints, change the solver a little bit, and uh, restart. So you can do a kind of a, a faster approximation to a point and then uh, kind of knuckle down a little bit and uh, work harder. Uh, and you don't have to be satisfied with uh, a solution that seems close. You can start up and change the termination condition again. I'll, I'll show a little bit of that. Um, in this case, we didn't have to. Now, if you look at the interface that we're, we're given here for Mystic, this is uh, all the, uh, these are all the different um, uh, interface attributes we have. Uh, so uh, we have things like uh, a hold of the uh, generations and the evaluations. These are essentially internal monitors that Mystic is using to hold those, those values. You look at things like energy history, uh, best solution and best energy, those are the X and Y values. Uh, I used solution above to just essentially return the best solution. Um, but in cases where there's optimizers that use multiple solutions, like uh, like a genetic algorithm that has a population matrix, uh, there's other solutions besides the best one that you can, uh, you can get also. So there's uh, a, a number of things like I was mentioning um, uh, where we can set the termination condition, uh, set uh, box constraints with uh, strict ranges, um, and uh, uh, change basically things like uh, set sampled initial points, which are uh, change the distribution of how you're picking random initial points. So things like that. Now let's look at, uh, so that, that gives us some flexibility in configuring our uh, optimization algorithm. And I didn't even mention uh, setting the penalty and uh, setting the constraints, but because uh, we'll get to those. Um, with termination conditions, one of the things that's nice is uh, being able to say, well, okay, I, I, I want to customize the termination condition to be something that uh, is meaningful to me, and um, uh, so you can actually write a custom termination condition that is exactly what you're looking for. If you have something that's a metric that matters to you, you can hook it into a termination class, a condition instance, a custom termination condition instance, and then instead of monitoring the, the change in the gradient, you monitor the change in whatever metric you're looking for, okay? Now, I didn't do that with these, but what I did is uh, I made a compound termination condition out of some of the existing ones. So there's VTR and change over generation. Now, change over generation is one of the standard ones for uh, differential evolution or genetic algorithms, which is it is gonna change less than some amount over uh, some number of iterations. And VTR is a, a standard termination condition for uh, steepest descent value. When it gets past this point, stop. Uh, so uh, the combination of both of those is to kind of uh, chop off the tail at the end of differential evolution. So what you find is to make uh, a lot of the global optimizers work really well, you have to put in lots and lots and lots of points. So uh, you're sure that it, it you know, it's trying to stop and it's trying to find the next value, and it takes oh, 200, 300 uh, iterations to find the next value, and then it has another 500 iterations before it maybe finds the next best value after that, and you end up having these big, 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 long tails. But uh, what, what happens is when you know you have the answer, then you wanna stop, but you still have to go through this big, long tail to get to the end where it, it actually doesn't do anything 
uh, and then eventually runs out because it hasn't changed over that generation. So one of the things you can do is is uh, apply a, 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 another termination condition like VTR, which just says if you've got this value, then just just stop. Um, and so what I'm doing here is I'm compounding these together. I'm saying my termination condition is uh, VTR at one e to the minus eight, or uh, the combination of change over generation for the default number of times and VTR at zero. Okay, so I'm either looking at if I hit one e to the minus eight, or I hit the combination of VTR at zero and go X number of iterations without, uh, without seeing an improvement. Um, and then I just hook that up as my termination condition, set the termination condition to this. Uh, like I said, it could be something that's more relevant to your problem if you just meet the simple interface that the termination conditions have. Uh, and then when we hook that up, you can see it runs, and this is uh, differential evolution again on the objective function here, set the objective function to Rosen, uh, and it, it runs and eventually stops, and uh, it prints and tells me that the termination condition it actually hit was where the tolerance was 1e e to the minus 8 and not the, the other compound condition which had change over generation and, and 0. Um, so that allows you to do something a little bit more uh, complicated for how algorithms stop. And actually what you find out is, uh, what I found out is um, your ability to solve the problem uh, is actually more driven by the termination conditions than it is by the optimizer itself. The optimizer itself, the algorithm tends to give you efficiency for getting to the solution. The algorithm like differential evolution or genetic algorithm, uh, or some other sort of simulated annealing, that's efficiency to the answer. But uh, the termination condition is actually, you know, you're looking for something that tells the optimizer when to stop. And if you have something that matches the criteria you're looking for very well, then you're very likely to solve the problem. And if you have something that's an abstract condition like the gradient uh, tails off to some small value, uh, then you're less likely to solve the problem, right? So it's actually, I mean, that was a surprise to me, is uh, termination conditions are actually stronger, uh, stronger than anything else except constraints, really, in, in being able to solve the problem, more so than the optimization algorithm. All right, so here's, a, here's an example of, um, uh, setting the, uh, using a distribution to set initial points in, in some solver. You say set sampled initial points. Uh, in this case, you have to use a, a, a mystic distribution object, which is basically built by uh, mystic uh, math uh, distribution. Um, and uh, it takes things like either a random number generator or it takes a sci-fi stats distribution object. And what it does is it uh, gives a unified interface for both of those. Uh, it's not, uh, nothing big, but it just gives a unified interface for uh, NumPy random and SciPy stats distribution and random number generators uh, to be used within Mystic to uh, set distributions in many different places. So this is one of them where we can pick the initial values. And you can see now I've set the initial values to be uh, in a normal distribution centered on five uh, with a standard deviation of one. And, um, and what I can do is then go in and look at the solver population. That's going to be my initial points and uh, take it and flatten it out and plot it in a histogram. And, and you can see that uh, for the number of values that I put in here, which is about 60, it's roughly normal. Sampled values centered on five. Okay. Um, so uh, let's let's now look at uh, really uh, where the one of the big uh, 
big features of, of MISTIC is to apply these uh, constraints operators or these uh, kernel transformations. So we go back to penalty functions, which we had before, which are this uh, uh, perturbation. We apply a penalty on the, on the potential energy surface. This is what a, a kernel transformation or a constraint operation looks like, uh, constraint operator looks like. Uh, you have, you have a, an objective function, f, where we've applied some mapping of space, a transformation of some space, uh, uh, whether it's a dimensional reduction by applying, uh, finding invariances, uh, the, the, the directions that have the strongest variances, or uh, a transformation to an easier space uh, to operate over, or uh, an application of any kind of constraint, just any kind of functional constraint it can apply. Um, uh, to reduce that space. So if you had some sort of constraint like we had before with uh, uh, these uh, constraint equations, you can apply those constraint equations as, a, as an operator and then work only over the solution uh, where it's met those constraints. Um, and, and what you have is you now have the objective function working over a new new space, the space of only the valid solutions to the constraints. Okay, so this is what you need for, this is what you need for working in a complex space of nonlinear constraints and uh, problems that actually have real physical, uh, physics-based or engineering-based constraints. Um, and uh, you get that out of the uh, so, so I'm going to just go through some of the examples of, of it being applied before I actually uh, get to uh, example problems. But you see, um, I have uh, Myst Mystic has um, uh, constraints, uh, penalties, uh, couplers. Um, and so you'll get things like, uh, uh, I want a... Uh, I want to, to build a mean constraint. So I want to build a mean constraint. And a mean constraint is I, I have a mean, and uh, I'm going to go from the mean of some of the parameters difference to some target. The goal of minimizing this again. Uh, here's a range constraint. So Mystic provides a mean and spread and a whole bunch of other of the standard kind of uh, NumPy mathematical values, uh, and they're intended to work on parameters. So the the spread gives you the range. What the peak to peak is essentially, um, and so I'm building functions that are functional constraints. Here is the const mean constraint against some value, and the range constraint against some value. And uh, what I can do is I can build a generic uh, penalties. So uh, they have to be in a functional form. So this is one way of building a constraint. I build a penalty function, and I decorate it with a quadratic inequality, which is the type of penalty function I'm going to apply. And the condition I'm going to penalize is this mean constraint, and I'm going to also penalize the range constraint. And uh, the values that I need to fill in, anything else that I have that doesn't meet the uh, conditions of of just taking a parameter vector can be filled in with the keywords over here. So the keywords are target is five in both cases. So the solution we're looking for is uh, x values where the mean is five and the range is five. Um, and we're going to penalize against solutions where that's not valid, right? So the cost function is uh, the sum of the, the values minus five and take the absolute value. And uh, we do a minimization, f min, uh, for that cost function in uh, five dimensions, uh, apply the penalty function, uh, and we get some result, the, the y value. Uh, and you can see the mean of the y is five, the, the spread, which is the range, is, is five, um, and, and the cost itself is uh, uh, five, is uh, 20. Right, so that there it, uh, it's met the two constraints, the, the range and the mean constraint, 
uh, as well as being able to find some uh, the best value for it. Uh, so that's uh, uh, applying kind of a generic uh, generic functions as penalties uh, through a decorator interface. So uh, here's uh, another mean constraint. Here's a parameter constraint uh, which uh, says I'm going to set the last parameter value equal to the first parameter value basically. Um, okay, so that uh, binds those to get together and uh, here I penalize uh, where I have got quadratic inequality for the parameter constraint and the mean constraint. Um, and when we solve it, uh, you could see that the means constraint satisfied, the parameter constraint satisfied. All right, so this is just not even working actually within the, the solver themselves, just showing how the penalty functions and, uh, and uh, constraints are used. Uh, here is actually, um, uh, okay, so uh, I'm taking a, another type of mean constraint with mean of one. So I build a constraint where I have uh, the last value of the parameter vector is equal to the first value of the parameter vector. So I'm setting two two of the parameters equal to each other, and also taking a mean constraint of one. Right, and you can see that when I solve the solve that, uh, I get uh, that that constraint is satisfied. Solve uh, comes from constraints. So what this is is uh, solve is says uh, I've providing a generic interface to constraints. There's actually several solves in Mystic. There's solve the constraints. There's solve a system of symbolic equations. Uh, and this is solve a system of constraints. And, and what solve is gonna give you is it gives you, uh, um, it gives you an interface that says, oh, I'm just gonna use whatever the default, whatever the, so uh, SciPy Optimize has a, as an interface that says minimize. Mystic has one that says solve. Solve using these constraints on, the, on a generic optimizer. And uh, you can actually pick the optimizer by saying, just like uh, SciPy optimize, method. Right? But what this allows you to do is you have a generic function that you can pick the different optimization method and they all can have these constraints applied to them. It's not any particular algorithm that requires a constraint. So you can have constraint uh, Nelder Mead, you can have constraint PAL, uh, you can have constraint uh, differential evolution. So it's, it's just a generic solver interface. And it, it comes from mystic constraints. That uh, it's a generic solver interface that takes penalty functions and, and constraints. Um, okay, so the same same thing here with the uh, mean constraint instead of a penalty function. Um, and a lot of these constraints are in, uh, uh, they're in several places in Mystic. One is if they're more mathematical or they uh, tend to be something that's uh, used in statistics, let's say, uh, they'll be in math.measures. Or if they tend to be something that's not uh, used in statistics as much, they're, it, either in constraints or tools, just depending on the flavor of what they are. So there's things like, I only want unique values in the, in the solution vector. Uh, that's, that's a constraint you can apply. I only want to work on integers. All right. Uh, so um, uh, it gives you the ability to, if you write a uh, penalty function like this one, I built a penalty function. Uh, I can turn it into a constraints operator, okay? So that's useful, but it's expensive. And what this means is, uh, think about a kernel transformation. Kernel transformation, if you have uh, an analytical solution to go from one space to another, your optimizer will be faster working in this reduced space. Instead of searching over all space, it's searching over the reduced space of valid solutions. Okay, so if you have an ability to write that out, the, the mapping of spaces, the kernel transformation from one space to the other, 
we, you'll hands down be faster, uh, even faster than a linear solver, because you're working over uh, a reduced search space instead of all space. Uh, however, uh, it's not often, or maybe sometimes, you don't have, uh, you don't have the uh, analytical solution for how to map space from one to the other. You have information, right? So for penalty functions can be built pretty easily uh, from pieces of information. If it, uh, if the, if the, um, if the solution is within some radius away from the data points, uh, then uh, it shouldn't be penalized, but if it's further than that, it gets penalized. That's a standard type of penalty that you use in machine learning. Uh, there's no analytical transformation for that. Uh, however, what Mystic can do in, in the case of um, not having an analytical transformation is you write a penalty function and you convert it into a, uh, a kernel transformation. And, and what it does is essentially it, it solves a, uh, a internal optimization problem at every step. So it becomes more expensive. However, you get that kernel transformation you are looking for to reduce space. So uh, it's a way of, um, even if you don't have uh, an analytical mapping, you can still apply, uh, apply these kind of kernel transformations. Uh, it becomes more costly, but uh, you can do it. Well, no, it's opposed to not having the ability to do it at all. Uh, so, I mean, you either, if you have an analytical solution, it's very easy to, uh, if you have an analytical mapping, a kernel transformation, it's very easy to apply it and the, the optimizer essentially will just pick from the areas in space where there's valid solutions. But if you don't have this mapping analytically, uh, it's, it's often easy to capture the information as penalties. Where does it work? Where did it not work? But that doesn't give you the analytical mapping of one space to the other. Uh, and and what, uh, what this as constraint does is it says, given a penalty function, I'm going to solve a sub-optimization problem that says, when I try to pick a point, I want to make sure it satisfies my penalties. And there's no penalty. And so what it does is every time it tries to pick a point, it solves a mini optimization problem to make sure there's no penalty. And that gives you a numerical mapping instead of, a, instead of an analytical mapping. It, it's more expensive because of that, but uh, you know, it's uh, often being able to do it versus not being able to do it. Um, all right, so uh, actually, planned us to take a, a break here and uh, um, uh, because they're going to pick up the snacks pretty soon. Uh, so uh, that's important. Uh, uh, we'll, uh, <clears throat> we'll take a quick 15-minute uh, break to uh, go and uh, get yourself snacks if you want and uh, come back at uh, 1030. Okay, so, uh, so there's several different ways we can make these uh, Uh, constr uh, oh, there we go, that's what we're, um, there we go. Um, uh, so we can make these penalty functions and we could turn them into constraints. Uh, and uh, there's actually a lot of different ways we can make uh, constraint solvers. I'm just uh, introducing you to uh, several of the different mechanisms to do that here. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, so here's, uh, here's actually working with a solver, differential evolution, instead of the abstract interface, uh, where it's the differential evolution one-liner, and it's the cost function here. Uh, here's our applying a constraint, and the constraint in this case is uh, the function that we built out of the penalty functions as we've seen up above, applying a mean and a range constraint. Okay, and then we get an answer, and you can see the answer. Uh, 
And on this case, what it's going to do is it's only going to pick values that the mean and the range constraints are satisfied. And that's the space it's going to work with. Um, uh, and we could do the same if you happen to be able to build a constraint. And here's what the, uh, let me uh, uh, now solidify what the API is. Uh, a penalty function, penalty function needs to do nothing else than uh, take a uh, parameter vector, uh, an x value, solution vector, and, and return a numerical value, okay? So uh, typically, uh, the default penalty that does nothing takes uh, an x and it returns zero. And uh, the decorators allow you to augment that. Now, uh, you can go and write these as actual uh, penalties um, instead of using the direct decorator interface and then you'd have an interface where you write a function that essentially takes an x and ultimately you're, you're returning some value, okay? Some value is the, the value that uh, that penalty will take uh, when um, when it's when it's va violated or when it's evaluated, uh, uh, and so generically a penalty function takes an x and returns an, an integer, and um, a uh, a constraint, which is this mapping of space from one space to the other, uh, takes an x and returns an x. So it takes a solution vector and it returns the solution vector. Okay, and that means you're going to have some sort of transformation over the solution vector. What are you going to do? Well, you might set the last value equal to the first value, or you might make sure that uh, they, all the functions, all the parameters have a mean of five, or all of the uh, parameters are constrained to have a range of five. Okay? So what that does is you can write your own generic penalty or you can write your own generic constraint and, and apply it. And uh, that gives you the ability to, uh, if you want to write it in a functional interface the, 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 uh, and, and do it all yourself, the, uh, the, the API is just purely, it takes an x and returns an x for constraints and uh, it takes an x and returns an integer for, uh, uh, sorry, a float for, for penalties. Um, Satisfied? Um, so it actually doesn't matter. Uh, it just matters that the, con that the constraints are satisfied. So how it gets there depends on the algorithm. Uh, you can, uh, the beautiful thing about it is they're mystic optimizers ultimately that are being used internally and you can pass a, an optimization instance. You can pass an optimization instance that if you need it to have a particular distribution, I, I showed uh, there's a function set sample distribution. Each of the solvers takes a keyword dist. That allows you to set up the initial distribution of, of points so that uh, if you need to worry about how the space is mapped, you can, you, you can do that with your sampling of points. Um, uh, if you want to, uh, pick an algorithm that is very likely to succeed uh, and it might take longer versus a, a, a linear solver, uh, you can pick one of those two as well. So you can customize the solver that you're going to use uh, in all the different ways you can customize the outer solver itself uh, in the, in the sub-problem of, of ensuring those constraints are satisfied. So, so you can either sample it if, if you have information about it, right, of, of how the solution might look, you can actually impose that in how you're solving the problem uh, to, to solve those constraints. But if, you're, if you want a totally uniform space with a, a uniform sampling solver, you can build one of those and use it as the, the internal solver. So that's, uh, uh, this gives you the flexibility to do that. Just customize the solver and use that as the internal 
solver for, constra for constraints. And it actually becomes uh, a telescoping problem. So uh, I will, uh, the, the, the fanciest case that I've ever gotten is uh, doing a, a kind of a, uh, a, a risk analytics problem, an uncertainty quantification problem, which was um, uh, something like uh, minimize the likelihood. So it's an optimization to minimize the likelihood that something happens. And likelihood is expectation values, probability and expectation values. So that's an optimization problem. It's a min-max optimization problem. And then there's a lot of constraints that were satisfied. So that's already three levels deep of optimization uh, that can be handled. And I, I've done up to five. So you can, uh, it, that's the nice thing about it is, is uh, you can take a nonlinear problem and you can break it down into lots of smaller, less nonlinear problems where you customize the type of, sol of solver for solving each one of those constraints based on the physical information and needs that you have of the, of the, uh, of the particular solution of the constraints. And, and uh, mystic solvers can be telescoping based on uh, solving constraints and other things see where it goes. So, so I, I don't, uh, I, I, I let you worry about it instead of uh, Mystic having to make a choice. Uh, okay. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I just, uh, there's a whole bunch of different ways that you could see here that uh, uh, these things are applied. Um, Um, and uh, I, I even have uh, compound. Uh, I, I give you, so what couplers do is uh, couplers uh, give you several mechanisms for coupling uh, constraints and uh, uh, penalties together. So um, here I had uh, coupler inner. Inner coupler means apply one constraint first and then apply the other constraint after it. So there's, those are very good if you have two independent variables, two independent constraints. You can have, uh, you can set something to be an inner coupler versus an outer coupler. You can think of applying a kernel transformation and then applying another kernel transformation, right? Two coupled kernel transformations, one and the other. Uh, and that's how an inner coupler would work. Uh, there's um, additionally, couplers that do and, or, and not. Okay, so there's inner and outer couplers. There's and, or, and not. Uh, and what that says is, you know, I, 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 they're not independent. They're not independent kernel transformations, so they need to be coupled together to have a joint uh, kernel transformation where it applies one kernel transformation and another simultaneously, or one or the other or one and not the other. So you can build compound, compound kind of uh, linguistics about how your uh, uh, constraints are, are, are gonna be utilized. And the reason I had these things like uh, mean and range and, and things like that as constraints, because that's the kind of information you tend to get out of a physical problem. Right? You take a measurement and you get a mean constraint. You take a, uh, you take a, a measurement and you get a range constraint. So those are physical kind of things you want to map onto, uh, onto your, um, onto your physics, onto your optimization problem. So here's some of the, um, here's using some of these constraints. Uh, let's say I have these two functions: a sum, a product, uh, and an average. And uh, uh, what I can do is I can build a. Uh, here's a constraint function. It takes an x. Uh, uh, actually, I'm building penalties here. Uh, I take an x and I produce a function value. Take an x and produce a function value. So these are three penalty functions. Uh, I take those and put them into a tuple. Uh, and then I say, uh, for this penalty type, uh, for this penalty type, build me a penalty function uh, x and take zero. Uh, so that's, that's basically, uh, an abstract way of doing what I showed above with the decorator. You can see that this is actually the decorator 
syntax not using decorator. This is the quadratic uh, inequality, a quadratic equality here, the penalty function, and applying these functions as penalties. And now I have a list of these penalties that I'd like to apply, and I can apply them with an and. And each of those penalties, um, and, and that gives me a penalty for all three of those penalties applied simultaneously. Now, for penalties, it's uh, and is just adding them together. That's pretty easy. But for constraints, it's a little bit more difficult. You're compounding termination, uh, you're compounding uh, kernel transformation. Uh, so I can take the cheap way of turning them to by actually the, uh, the beautiful thing about as constraint is um, if I don't want to work really hard, I just say as constraint, I write the penalty functions, which tend to be easy to write. I say as constraint, and then I go home and suffer and wait for the answer, because it usually takes a while. Um, if, if I'm smarter and I work harder uh, to, to actually get a better form of the constraint instead of having it solve an optimization problem at every point, uh, uh, the, the work pays off in that it, it evaluates faster. But so this is the, uh, this is basically the, uh, the brute force mechanism of building a constraint out of these uh, penalties. All right, so um, uh, <coughs> here I'm applying the constraint, and you can see that uh, the constraint is satisfied in every one of those cases uh, for, for the penalty that's, that's applied. And so um, here's some... Uh, constraint type stuff, uh, impose the product, impose a sum, impose a mean. Uh, so those are, uh, those are constraint type functions. Here's our constraint functions. You can see they take an x uh, and they're, um, uh, well, they're returning an x. So impose the sum on, uh, of x1 on x. So that's impose the sum of I think, uh, what do I have up here? Five, five, and one. Okay, so a sum of five, a product of five, and uh, a mean of one. Uh, so those are three constraints functions that I have. I put it into a tuple. Uh, and in this case, I am uh, saying I want those to be converted into penalties. I combine the penalties together and convert it back to a constraint. Um, I can actually combine the uh, constraints together. So here's a uh, constraint that takes a mean of five. It enforces a mean of five. Here's a constraint that enforces integers. So this is saying uh, there's a discrete, uh, which says I only want to operate over a discrete set, where the discrete set is the uh, uh, range 0 to uh, 10. Okay, so the only points that are going to be picked in my optimization are points uh, 0 through 10. Uh, it's a discrete set of integers. And the points are also going to all have a mean of 5. So you expect this optimization should proceed pretty quickly. Um, and what we can do is we can compound both of those constraints together with AND and make our, our single constraint operator. We have a single kernel transformation of the space to the space of 0 through uh, 10, where each of the values that uh, are going to be picked has, has a mean of 5. Um, and you can see that uh, each one of those that uh, I apply uh, with the AND satisfies both of those individual conditions. Uh, I can pick any random value, and the result when the constraint of the kernel transformation is applied satisfies both, both of those. Uh, you can see that uh, if I use OR, it's going to satisfy one or the other of them. Uh, if I use NOT, uh, NOT integers, uh, it's not going to satisfy the integer constraint. Okay, so that way you have uh, a lot of different ways of specifying kind of 
the information you'd like to constrain the space by uh, and uh, converting it into something that's more compound or flexible with uh, and or and not. Um, all right. So that's doing with uh, compound termination conditions. Um, uh, so uh, one of the issues, uh, one of the issues with penalty functions that's always been a, a difficulty in solving with penalty functions. Penalty functions are easier to build. Uh, they're they're less expensive to work with in many cases. Um, if you have an, they're easier to write an analytical solution for. Uh, however, you know, what what they tend to do is uh, if you have a solver that can take uh, five, six, seven penalty functions. Uh, the problem is you'll have you'll have an application of uh, like a log function or a parabola when the one penalty is uh, uh, violated. And you have a application of another log function or a parabola or some other shape when the other penalty is violated. And what that means is you start imposing all sort of different parabolic and log surfaces on top of your original surface. And your original surface ends up being obfuscated. You actually, uh, by applying one or more penalties, you can actually not get to the your actual true solution. You only get to an approximate of the solution on the penalty surface. Or even worse, the penalties can intersect and create uh, a new uh, false local minima. And you could find the local minima of intersecting penalties. So penalties, uh, while they're uh, a bit of a cheaper way, you have to be careful about them. I tend not to apply more than one or two penalties on any problem uh, because, um, because of that. You can get false surface features and uh, it's actually harder to find the solution. If you can get a good constraint, a good kernel transformation, uh, that is uh, the better way to go. Um, so uh, here, uh, we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at Rosenbrock again, and in this case, uh, we're going to apply our friend that we've met this uh, mean constraint, and we're going to apply a mean constraint of one. Now we already know the solution is one one one, so this is really uh, cheating the space pretty hard. Uh, the mean constraint is one, and uh, I'm actually also constraining the last value to be the first value. Uh, so the space we're going to be working over is going to be uh, pretty tight uh, bound to what the solution looks like. Uh, and I do a uh, fmin pal uh, with this uh, constraints where I've got a iteration monitor that's going to show me uh, the energy at each point. And you can see after the first step, it almost immediately goes down to zero and then just stops. Uh, so this, it, it essentially went from uh, doing it on, it on its own in uh, 15 to 20 iterations down to two iterations. Uh, and that's what you get for working over a more constrained space. If you have information that you can apply it uh, and, and the, uh, kernel trans the kernel transformations are analytical, you can really speed up your optimization quite a bit um, and, and make it more likely to solve. Uh, so Mystic can take these box constraints and that's just a set strict range. Uh, or, or from the one-line interface bounds. Now, one of the things that uh, I have done is I've, I've um, only talked about working with uh, a functional interface to it. But let's say uh, you know, let's say you have equations, and you'd like to use those symbolic equations. You can actually uh, just give symbolic equations, and and uh, Mystic uh, uses a combination of itself and SymPy to. Uh, to build functional constraints, operators, kernel transformations, and penalty functions out of uh, symbolic equations. Um, so there's some elements of Mystic that should probably go into SymPy, like uh, the ability to solve uh, symbolic inequalities. Uh, that may be better in SymPy, but uh, right now that's in Mystic. Um, but uh, uh, so let's say we have this uh, tension compression spring and uh, here's the equations that we have uh, that are our constraining equations. You can see they're pretty nasty kind of equations. There's fourth order and third order and uh, 
whatnot, and their inequalities. Uh, and that's just writing them as a symbolic expression. And uh, I'm giving them as a string. I'm not using a SymPy, uh, SymPy uh, expression. I'm just writing them as a string. Mystic will uh, you, uh, convert them to SymPy expressions underneath the covers. Um, and you take these uh, equations and you say, uh, for penalty functions, uh, generate conditions which uh, builds, uh, builds a individual condition, uh, essentially uh, inequality or equality constraint, one per line. Uh, and then penalty will, from those conditions, build a single penalty, compound penalty function. Uh, so I will have now a penalty function that uh, is looking to satisfy those conditions right here. You can see my objective is just x squared, x naught squared times x1 times x2 plus 2 under these, under these conditions. And that's actually uh, conditions for a uh, tension compression spring when I'm trying to solve uh, uh, an optimal value for, for some of the physical coefficients. And I, I take it into differential evolution. I can pick any of the solvers. I, I apply uh, uh, bounds here. Uh, so this is setting box constraints at the bounds. This is, if you give, uh, by the way, I didn't mention, if you give uh, points, that's points the solver will start at. But if you give bounds a range, it'll instead recognize that you've given it bounds instead of uh, points, and it'll randomly pick from within those bounds. Uh, here is it saying I'm enforcing those bounds as opposed to uh, just randomly picking from some points and, and not having box constraint. And we apply the penalty function. Okay, so uh, we'll look at that uh, a little bit below and, and, and then basically uh, check the result. Now, um, here's taking it down step by step. Uh, here's, here's the uh, equations from above, and uh, Mystic has symbolic, so Mystic, symbolic, uh, work with symbolic equations. Generate constraints, generate solvers, uh, a symbolic solve, it has a symbolic simplify. Uh, simplify is essentially isolate uh, one of the variables on, uh, on the left-hand side. Um, it works for equality and inequality constraints. Uh, and then generate the penalty and generate the conditions. So uh, uh, penalty and conditions are the two things that work for penalty functions. And uh, constraints and uh, solvers are the two things that work for uh, building constraints, uh, these operators. So we're going to take uh, generate conditions uh, from these equations. And you can see what it does is it builds a grouping of equality and inequality constraints. and when we print them, uh, when we print them, you can see what we get is uh, here's the inequality and equality constraints. So you essentially get a inequality function, uh, and you get a equality function. There are no equality functions in this case uh, that come out of it. And and if we look at the documentation of each of those, you can see the documentation contains uh, the symbolic form of the functions what it's contained. So since it's hard to kind of read what type of uh, function this represents, you look at the documentation and it uh, automatically stores essentially the, uh, what it took here from the, from the symbolic equations and it stores it as the documentation. Okay, so that's building these inequality and equality conditions. And then what we can do is take those inequality and equality conditions and turn them into a penalty function. That's what we have, penalty function. When you look at the documentation for the penalty function, the documentation for the penalty function is printed here. It says, uh, this is just a single print and it's four lines. I have four quadratic inequalities of those values. Right? And that's what the documentation looks like. And that's, that's our penalties from the symbolic equations. Uh, and then we can, we can essentially apply that in the optimization problem. Okay, so that's, uh, 
those are the steps of going uh, symbolic to uh, to a penalty or uh, alternately symbolic to a constraint. Um, I could have simplified. I could have, uh, before going to conditions, I could have said simplify the equations. Sometimes that helps uh, in getting uh, better uh, uh, equations that are easier to solve, basically, uh, for the optimizer, because the optimizer is going to be utilizing these functions underneath. So I often simplify the equations first and uh, symbolically simplify the equations and see if that helps. All right, so here's doing the same thing uh, as we were doing above, but uh, not using, uh, using what we saw before, using the non-symbolic interface. So here's the equations, and I can write a penalty function that looks like that. That looks, due to our friend NumPy, it looks very similar to the first equation. And what we have to remember is Mystic has all of the penalty functions either equal to zero or less than or to equal to zero. So this value, uh, less than or equal to zero, is, is what we're setting as a penalty function. We build our four penalty functions for the four equations and then strap them into a quadratic inequality on as decorators on a penalty function. And those several lines with the decorator uh, will give you exactly the same thing as, uh, as if you just were to do this, this line right here, taking them symbolically and going into a penalty function. Okay. Um, so you can pick either way you like to do it, then uh, it's more flexible to work with uh, the, them as, as functions, but uh, it's easier to work with them as symbolically. Uh, and you can see here, I'm going into differential evolution, applying these penalty functions, and uh, uh, I'm not doing any <clears throat> diagnostics printed out here, I'm just getting a result, and, and uh, that's, uh, with the, the penalty applied. All right, so uh, operators that uh, constrain space. Here's a typical problem that uh, a very specific operator, uh, uh, optimizer, uh, will, will solve, and Mystic does it okay. Uh, it's a cryptography problem, and uh, it's basically, I have 26 letters in the alphabet. Uh, these 26 letters are uniquely mapped to a letter. We don't know what the letters are. Uh, and the ultimate solution we want is uh, each one of the letters are identified. Uh, and then it gives a puzzle uh, where the sum of those letters turn into uh, a value. So ballet is 45, cello is 43, et cetera. Right? And, um, uh, because these aren't x's, the list of variables we're going to be using is uh, a through z. So we make a list of our variables. We have to specify the variables. Now I'm going to make it a little easier on Mystic by, by giving it the vowels. Uh, you can not give the vowels, but uh, just to, to make it faster, give the vowels. Um, and uh, uh, what this is doing is I'm saying, OK, in the bounds, where the bounds are going to be from uh, 0 to 25, right? There's that many letters. So the bounds are specific values between 0 and 25. And we have to figure out what those are. Uh, bounds 0 is fixed at 5. That's A. Bounds 4, uh, E, is fixed at 20. And so I say I know what those, those, those values are. And I'm using range constraints, in this case, to fix the values. I could fix it with an equation, but using range constraints is a very easy way to do it. Um, okay, so uh, we have to think about, okay, what do you need to do? Uh, you need to work over the space of integers, and also those integers have to be unique. So Mystic has uh, constraints for both of those. Uh, I want to have, uh, I want to be at integers, or at least near integers, that's, uh, that's a constraint. You can say, I want to be near integers with some tolerance, uh, and I want these uh, solutions to be unique. Uh, 
Uh, we saw discrete before, so there's another way to do it. You can give a discrete set of values you're going to work over. Right? That's also uh, another type of constraint that you can use. So there's a lot of different ways to apply these types of constraints. Uh, here I'm just I'm, I'm showing more of a how to roll uh, your own. Uh, so here's a quadratic inequality where I'm penalizing it not being on integers, it penalizing it not being near the integers, and I'm penalizing it for not having unique values. There is actually a better way. I mean, if you want to work at it, there's a better way to do this, and it's not to use penalties. It's to purely use constraints. Uh, using penalties will, in these type of problems, lend to give you an approximate solution. And you could see, even the example case I ran, it almost gets it right. Uh, uh, so if you, you know, I don't have it as an exercise, but if you want to strip off and don't use the penalties and just use constraints, what you can do, you can apply things like NP round, uh, or NumPy's round, uh, to make it work on, on constrained to the integers. So things like that. Um, and so I'm building a constraint where we're uh, forcing the rounded values to be integers, uh, clipping it uh, between uh, the, the range of the letters, uh, 0 to 26, uh, making sure that they're unique. Okay, so those are all things that are kernel transforming or constraining the space. And uh, we're going to take this, and instead of using a specialty optimizer, like a mixed integer programming optimizer, I'm going to use differential evolution. Okay, so one of the worst cases for trying to work over a discrete set is a, a random global solver like this. But uh, we can do that. We can uh, apply the penalty that we've built above and apply the constraint we've built above and work over differential evolution. And you can see very quickly it goes down to solutions that are approximately right. And in this case, it got to one and uh, didn't quite make it, but it, it got very close. There's a duplicate in here somewhere. If I was to look, that's probably what uh, we have. And I can actually change, if I didn't want it to have as, uh, if I wanted to uh, say, well, I want less likelihood for there to be duplicates and still use penalties, what I would do is I would uh, kick up the k value, the multiplier uh, for has unique. And that would cause a stronger penalty than one for, for there not being a unique value. So that basically looks very similar to what the answer is. Uh, so I mean that uh, um, hopefully is not underwhelming that you're doing uh, a, a, a continuous global solver on a space of integers, unique integers. Uh, uh, essentially you can build whatever type of physical constraint you're, you're looking for. Uh, so here's another mixed integer programming case. Uh, here's my constraining equations, um, and it's a seven-dimensional space with uh, bounds between zero and ten. Okay, um, and uh, what we're going to do is uh, again take these symbolic constraints. Uh, we're going to take the equations, symbolically solve the equations, turn them into uh, a all-in-one constraint function and then apply that constraint function uh, within the optimizer and have it work on only over the solution of those, uh, basically have the solver only work over the space where those equations are valid. And it actually does it pretty quickly. Um, and in this case, uh, it only takes one iteration uh, to get the right answer. Uh, that's because we had an analytical transformation to go from one space to the other. And so it's only searching over the space of valid answers to those constraints equations. It, uh, it gets it pretty quickly. Um, uh, all right. So uh, I give you the uh, pre pressure vessel design problem uh, below, uh, which uh, you can use. Uh, uh, and that's a, a mechanism using the symbolic constraints to, to solve that problem. Uh, and, uh, 
I will save that uh, if people want to try that as, a, as an exercise. Um, here is uh, another example, linear and quadratic constraints. So something you might do with uh, CVX opt. It's actually one of the problems from the previous section. We have minimized subject to these constraints uh, with the bounds of minus infinity and uh, infinity. And here's our objective. You see it looks a lot like the equation here. And here's our equations. Now I have four constraint equations, but I only did three of them. And the reason why I only did three is this one can very easily be converted into a box constraint. Right? It's, a, it's a very simple box constraint. X1 is greater than or equal to zero. So here, X1 is greater than or equal to zero. Right? This is X0. This is X1. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is then, <coughs> uh, you can actually, if you think about it like this, it's interesting. I can use both penalties and constraints at the same time with exactly the same equations. So here's take those symbolic equations and generate a penalty for those symbolic equations. Uh, take those symbolic equations, simplify them, build constraints for those symbolic equations and apply both the penalties and the constraints. So uh, what that does, and the reason why, uh, you shouldn't ever have to apply both the penalty and the constraints at the same time. But I found, uh, I found it's actually nice to do that in many cases. And what it does is because each application of a constraint is essentially a kernel transformation which may or may not be using a numerical solution to the constraints, what happens is if it's a little off, if the kernel transformation is applied almost perfectly, right? So what happens is the solution to the optimization problem converges and doesn't give you a perfect solution, then you should penalize it a little bit to move it down to a perfect solution. Uh, so by uh, applying the penalty, even if, even in the kernel transformation, because it's a numerical transformation in some cases, applying the penalty gives you that extra oomph to, to go to uh, the actual solution and, and at very little cost. So often what I do in, is uh, apply both uh, the same information as a constraint and a, and a penalty if I know it's not an analytical transformation that's being applied. Right, you can see that <coughs> This uh, took s only six iterations to, to get to our answer, which was 0.5 and 1.5. Okay. That's uh, minimized that function subject to those constraints. Um, and uh, so I, I, have a, I have a number of examples here. I think there's one, two, three, four, five, five examples. Uh, they're essentially all about uh, applying constraints. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd like you to just to get your hands dirty uh, trying them a little bit and uh, um, try them so if it stimulates some questions and uh, we'll do that. So we'll, uh, we'll go for uh, another uh, 15 minutes on just uh, trying them out. All right, so was that, uh, were those... A little bit easier to work with, maybe. I think uh, if people tried them. Um, so again, like I said, I will. Uh, I'll post uh, solutions to these uh, at the end of the class, and uh, um, and actually, um, in terms of uh, in terms of Mystic itself, uh, the repository has uh, has about. I, I believe it's somewhere on the order of 100, 200. No, actually, I just recently counted. It's 200 uh, or so uh, examples. Uh, there's a, a whole directory of about 75 different problems. Some of these are included as uh, just constraints and penalties. Um, and uh, uh, also the test. Uh, it has an extensive test suite that shows kind of the some of the uses of the features that are not in the examples. Uh, so, so I have questions people had on, on, on this that came up from, 
from trying to apply these uh, constraints. why that happens. Uh, so you, um, let's see, I'm going to assume you built the constraint probably the same way as up here. Yeah. Uh, the case is that, uh, that it's, uh, um, uh, so it's, it's relying on uh, two internal optimizations happening. One is in simplify. It's uh, symbolically solving the equations, one on each side. And if that isn't done, uh, if that isn't done extremely well, then you can get uh, you can get uh, an inexact or in uh, a fractional kind of. Uh, so, so sometimes a good simplification, sometimes a good simplification gives you integer values or simple values everywhere. And sometimes it gives you nasty like square roots and stuff like that. And each one of those things can lead to a, uh, uh, an approximate value. So you're now talking about a kernel transformation that may be approximate in this case. And, and, and again, on building the constraint itself. So the two places you're doing uh, optimizations that may be inexact. And, and, and that's why I was saying before that uh, in the case of where you may have an inexact solution, uh, where your kernel transformation is inexact, uh, you can apply the penalty to help ensure that uh, it makes up for the places where it, it, it possibly can fail. And so, uh, and that's, and whatever, so simplify will work differently each time. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not a, um, <clears throat> Uh, it's not a deterministic algorithm, so you may get a solution that's uh, uh, you may get a solution that's that's better running it again, and and ultimately what that means is you get a mapping that's slightly better. So, for that reason, I often do apply the penalty there because you know uh, you're essentially depending on the optimization, this internal optimization working perfectly each time, and. And it may not. It may not. It may wor work very well, but not perfectly. Anything else? Okay. Um, um, and again, I, I uh, for people who have who have used this and their exposure to uh, how the interface works in trying it, if you have any suggestions. Uh, Please feel free to uh, to uh, put them on uh, at, uh, the uh, issue uh, in GitHub. Uh, it's actually very easy to add solvers. Or there's an API. There's an interface for solvers and termination conditions and everything else. And basically, you can add your own. Uh, and if you're not, uh, if you don't feel up to the task of adding your own, and you'd like to just uh, spin it off as a as a ticket, then then please do that. Uh, You'll probably get to it before me, but you never know. I might be on a plane somewhere and uh, before we start uh, getting that done. There's other people who also contribute too. But uh, so uh, anyway, um, if you do have suggestions, Mystic's uh, tickets page is pretty active. Um, all right. So uh, in the time we have left, <coughs> I want to deal with uh, a little bit more of. Um, running these solvers in uh, parallel, uh, basically parallel computing and some extensions uh, that uh, utilize parallel computing. So uh, one of the things that, uh, one of the things you have here is now with uh, the potential for nested optimizations, optimizations that are being used as part of a kernel transformation at each point to solve an optimization you can get things that are expensive. So it's it's a natural to be able to go to parallel computing. And actually, in Mystic, there are uh, several different levels 
in the optimizer that you can go to parallel computing. Uh, what I want to do, even before I talk about parallel computing, is I want to show that uh, Mystic is actually built to do uh, asynchronous, uh, asynchronous computing, and uh, the solvers themselves are built for parallel computing in that they're serializable. Okay, so a solver is serializable. You can take the entire state of the solver, all the elements in the solver, monitors, everything you hook up to it, and you can uh, serialize it. You can either pick a list or, uh, or you could say uh, save solver and save it to a pickle file or a database. Uh, and um, and the, the state of the solver will get s uh, saved. Um, and uh, then you can uh, take a solver and, and load a solver. And it loads it directly from that uh, saved state. And what I'm showing you here is uh, asynchronous, is that every what you've seen up to the, this point is solved, the, the solve interface. But uh, Mystic has a step interface as well. And what this allows you to do is go iteration by iteration. So you can say, I want to start and then go uh, six steps here, step, 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 step. And you can check and see if it's terminated each step by uh, asking solver terminated, okay? And um, I'm not checking to see if it's terminated, but I would use solver.terminated to see if it was terminated or not. And all solve is, is in an internal loop that says step and then checks to see if it's terminated. If it's not terminated, it takes another step. So this now uh, decouples the, the need to run to the end of the solution. It allows you to say, you can write your own thing that takes the solver one step at a time and if you want to put some intelligence in there to decide how you want to move next, do you want to take another step or, or whatever you can. One of the things that I, I, I've done in a, in a kind of a manual way that's then made itself into uh, a, a, a higher level workflow in the solver is say, okay, I'm going to take initial optimization problem and solve it a certain distance, maybe to the termination and then uh, save that solver uh, as an instance, and then pass that instance off to a uh, whole bunch of parallel comp nodes, and then slightly tweak the uh, conditions of the solver, change the population, change the conditions, pe penalty conditions, something, and then restart the solvers. And then you have N instances of the solver starting from a already some semi-converged, converged condition uh, running in parallel. So you can do things like that that uh, allow you to do things that are interesting. Like now, uh, so that comes back to the idea in, in, in chemistry or in physics. What I wanted to do was say, you know, I'm not satisfied with trying to find the potential energy surface of a chemical reaction. Right? To find a potential energy surface, what people do is they they find the minimum, and then they do random walks to try to get what the landscape looks like. So MISIG is actually built to solve those type of physics problems where you want to learn the entire potential energy surface in one go. Basically, in parallel, solve the entire potential energy surface. Solve for, solve for all the minima, solve for all the maxima, solve, change the termination conditions to solve for inflection points, places where the first derivative is zero, change determination to find where the, the second derivatives are zero, find the inflection point, interpolate the surface, get a nice picture of the surface. Uh, you can do that, uh, and, and you can do it in parallel. So these are some of the tools that uh, uh, you would use, and one of the things you have to do is be able to make the solver uh, pickleable, essentially serializable, so you can pass it around in parallel computing. Now, it, it has a side effect of being able to work as a, as a checkpoint. So you have a fully state capturing checkpoint where you can run to the end of a, and you can think about how that changes the dynamic of it working. Let's say you have an optimization problem that you solve, that you solve all the time. And what you do is you solve it once, and then you save that problem. And then when you have a new data point that comes in, you restart the optimization from the solved solution and just check how much that one data point affects the problem. 
if it doesn't affect the potential energy surface too much, you're done, right? But if it does affect the potential energy surface, you then move from there. Okay, so that ends up saying, I'm not fast the first time, but in every subsequent application of it, I'm starting from a solved value that's an approximate, where I've got new information, you can move really quickly. Okay, so uh, you have the flexibility to do something like that. So here's uh, saving a solver, and then loading the solver from the save state, uh, and then continuing on uh, generation seven, eight, nine, and I say, okay, I'm just gonna run to the end, so I do solve, uh, and then I run all the, all the way down to the end. Uh, and, I, and again, I can take one of these saved solvers, uh, load it back up, tweak the state of the solver in some way, and then run again. Um, and that's how I actually build uh, what I call nested solvers and ensemble solvers. So that's the, the maj main picture uh, behind. And this is starting to be uh, a an area where you see uh, uh, several research groups going into ensemble uh, parallel computing for, for solving um, solving um, problems, and Mystic has had it uh, built into the uh, into itself for, for five years. Uh, it's basically the ability to run an initial distribution of solvers in parallel, or to take a solver, like in quantum chemistry, you often have a, a solver that runs down to a point, and another solver that's activated that's a local solver, and then you go back to the original solver, and then the other solver. So gives you the flexibility to do that. Uh, so here's a auto saving state. Uh, you basically say set the save frequency to 10, dump it to a save file, uh, and then it runs and solves it and dumps it to a save file, which then you can load and you can see that it has the same state as, uh, as the solver that finished. Um, there's a package called uh, Klepto uh, which uh, is, uh, is, is used here. Uh, it's an uh, abstraction on, uh, so think about uh, database tables like uh, pandas or, uh, or a database itself uh, or files on a file system. Uh, Klepto essentially abstracts all of those uh, to, uh, to something that uh, just, it just works on tables but it provides a caching mechanism that you can hook up to um, uh, a function, like a cost function. Uh, and additionally, what it uh, klepto uh, provides that uh, a lot of the other packages don't is that uh, you can, uh, there's a thing call, it called uh, local caching and uh, centralized archive. Uh, so you can build local caches and you could build a centralized archive like a database and a local memory cache. Uh, and those things are applied with a decorator. So there's a whole part that I'm not gonna get into here, but uh, uh, if you're interested and you wanna look at it, Mystic integrates very well with Klepto to, uh, to be able to do things like run, uh, run expensive calculations on a whole bunch of different uh, machines where you have local caching for results that work in memory and uh, for things that uh, want to have sharing between the different uh, uh, instances, they can share through a database or, or files on a file system. It's pretty transparent that way. Um, uh, for, so that's uh, parallel computing uh, on the cheap. Uh, there's <coughs> parallel computing itself. Uh, there's, like I said, several levels that uh, Mystic can utilize it. Uh, uh, the, the Pathos package, uh, Pathos has multiprocessing, Pathos has um, uh, several different backends. Uh, so uh, multiple processors, multiple threads. Uh, there's a piece of it that does uh, a distributed computing with uh, a fork of uh, uh, parallel Python, so that works for socket connections. Uh, so you can work on different computers. Uh, uh, there's a, a version of this fork of Pyena, which is uh, MPI, the MPI for Pi, uh, with the map 
essentially MPI for Pi with a map layer. Um, so you can work with uh, Torque and Slurm and all those uh, different uh, schedulers. Uh, and, and essentially what Mystic takes at each level of parallelism is it takes a, a pool or a, or a map. And if you have a pool or a map, uh, or uh, if you have a pool or a map function, uh, which is the standard multiprocessing interface, uh, it can swallow that at uh, several different levels to provide parallelism w across function evaluations, across solver iterations, or across the, the solvers themselves. Uh, solver instances themselves. So let's look at a case of very cheap uh, parallel computing that's not part of uh, Mystic itself and that's saying I want to do it myself. Remember how we before were running several instances of a solver, right? Uh, we'd run a loop of the solver several times and just check the, check the results. So I built a little helper function that essentially runs the solver uh, and uh, and here what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a, uh, a UI map, which is um, a uh, unordered map iterator. Uh, and that unordered map iterator comes from uh, building a pool. And from that pool instance, uh, you do uh, IMAP unordered. So that gives an iterator where it doesn't care about the sequence, embarrassingly parallel. Um, uh, it's the same multiprocessing interface. And here's the solver uh, and the model being passed uh, to this helper function to run the, the solver it instance itself over some random entry points. Uh, and then we get our results. And then we go through and print what those results are. So now uh, these runs of, of the solution value and the energy that we're at uh, were done in parallel. So that's, uh, that's the solver itself working in parallel. Not internally the solver, but that's instances of the solver itself being run in par parallel. And that's just because Mystic can be uh, parallelizable easily, serialized. Um, but that's, there's actually built-in ability to do things like that. Uh, and so one of the things, one of the places it's uh, built in is, uh, um, uh, so there's there's this, which is set mapper, uh, and essentially what you're asking Mystic to do is uh, it has an abstract base class for solvers. So if you want to write your own solver, meet the meet the base uh, API for a solver. But it has a, a parallel solver, which essentially says if you've got a map function, uh, you can use set mapper. To, uh, uh, to run that algorithm in parallel. Um, and that is internal to the solver algorithm itself. So uh, differential evolution, uh, the population points can be, can be solved in parallel. Um, for a simplex, you, know, you can solve the simplex points in parallel. Uh, that actually doesn't buy you too much most of the time, unless you have a really expensive function. But uh, the the uh, Mystic has these things called um, uh, ensemble solvers, where the map function for them are instances of a solver itself. And uh, so this one called a lattice solver, uh, what you essentially have is, um, let's see, here, uh, we're going to, take a verbose logging monitor, which uh, we're going to take a lattice solver. A lattice solver essentially says, uh, I have a, a lattice of points that I'm going to start my solvers at. Okay, so as you imagine a n-dimensional lattice in space with uh, cut planes into it, and each of the solvers are starting at each of those cut planes, cross sections. Uh, if I, uh, if I start in the standard way, which is to start with uh, fixed starting points, they start at the cross points of the solver, or however it's configured, uh, n numbers of those cross points of solvers. Uh, however, uh, if you give it a distribution with set, uh, give it a mystic distribution, uh, what it does is it does some 
random distribution, random sample uh, around those, those lattice points. Now there's another type of solver that uh, these ensemble solvers that, that Mystic has, which is uh, essentially just pick from a distribution. So I, I, one of them that's a stock one that I call Buckshot, what it is is uh, it's a normal distribution of solvers. So if you know you have some region of space that's the one you want to look at, you do a n-dimensional kind of buckshot distribution around that space of your solver, and it all focuses on trying to, to solve n, n times in parallel uh, around that space. Uh, you can again configure the distribution. Uh, so here's, uh, in this case what we have is, it's a lattice solver, so the solver itself doesn't actually have an algorithm in itself, it's, uh, it's a lattice and it's a lattice that's being run in parallel with uh, set mapper here. The nested solver itself is the solver that gets, you know, I said you could nest solvers within each other, so in this case, if you have an ensemble of lattice points and each of the sub points is using a Powell directional solver, what you get is a lattice distribution across space that each point is going to do a local solve to try to get to the nearest um, minimum. And that way, uh, what you're doing is doing a pseudo-global distribution, right? You're kind of mapping out space and then doing quick solves across space in parallel to try to find, uh, try to find the minimum. All right, so that's, uh, and then the rest of it you've, you've, you've seen before, setting constraints and doing this solve with a different termination condition and getting a solution. Uh, so this is actually it running, and it running in parallel, and um, uh, I don't know if I used parallel computing for this or not, but uh, it can take a little while, but uh, it's less time than if you had to do it manually, and, and I only have four processors, and I'm running it like uh, in 32-way parallel or something like that, so uh, it can be slower than you'd expect. Um, uh, another thing that uh, Mystic has, which I won't uh, spend some time on, but I, I would say that uh, you should check out, is uh, uh, auto-dimensional reduction. So there's uh, termination conditions called collapse at and collapse as and several other collapse functions. And what they, what they are is uh, if you have two parameter vectors that are tracking each other, uh, a termination condition can say if it meets some criteria for how they track, where they track a phase or something like that, uh, the solver will stop, reduce those two dimensions to the one dimension, and then move on, right? And that works very well on things like support vector machines. So there's another uh, collapse at, if you collapse at zero and you expect the weights to be zeros, then when the weights start to hover around zero, it stops the weight at zero, collapses the dimensionality and moves on with the smaller problem. So that's uh, some additional termination <coughs> conditions which are very useful for things like machine learning, uh, support vector machine problems that, uh, that again, I'll just point you at. Um, so I talked about the nesting of solvers and the ensemble solvers, and ultimately the, the physics problem I was interested in was uh, getting a uh, a picture of all the minima, all the maxima, turning points in space, et cetera. And so uh, here is a global search. So there's a mystic searcher, and that's uh, basically uh, taking, uh, you know, again, the usual suspects. Uh, here's parallel computing, uh, a uh, termination conditions, uh, monitors, uh, here I'm, potentially using it, one of these archives uh, from, from Klepto. Um, and uh, what I would do is I, I have uh, two solvers. I don't, this is, I'm going to be using the buckshot solver and to, to generate new lattice points. So essentially what, uh, to generate new points. So what I'm going to do is just basically just keep shooting <laughs> keep shooting optim optimizers out in a random normal distribution around some point. And each of those will be PAL directional solvers. 
Um, and you have things like retries. So what a retry is for a searcher is it says, I have a goal in mind. The goal is to keep finding minima until I don't find minima anymore. To keep finding new termination, con uh, new satisfaction of the termination conditions until I don't find any new ones. Uh, so instead of doing a, finding the minima and looking at a random search, you essentially spray the optimizers across the space in some arrangement. And you know it's actually smart to, to say, well, I want to do a global mapping of space. I want to get stuck in the local minima. I want to get stuck in the local minima. I try to get a, a solver to, to find its way into local minima. And if you have the trajectories it took down there, you can get a very good mapping of what the entire surface looks like all at the same time. Uh, and so basically, I'm not going to do the full interpolation of the surface. There's an example that shows you how to do that, but I'll just show you how to get the all the minima and maxima. So, uh, so there's some things you know, re retry, uh, rounding precision, uh, etc. Uh, if you're dealing with a cache, you like a, a, a cache, a lookup in a cache to see if it's found already. You have to have also uh, rounding precision as well. Um, and uh, ultimately what we do is uh, we have a, uh, a searcher here, which uh, um, we set it to be verbose. We're not going to use trajectories, I believe. We're going to use a, uh, a back end, uh, a, a, a log file in this case. Um, uh, and then we, uh, this, is, this is solving the problem once. We start the archive. Uh, search, and this will essentially keep spraying optimizers until uh, we don't find a new minima. Uh, and then this gives a little summary of, of how long it took. Uh, I can extract all the trajectories basically here with samples. Uh, and then I'm going to do the inverse problem. I flip it to, uh, I flip it to the negative of the model, so I'm going to find the maxima. And then I do it again. I reset and I search to find all the maxima and I do a summary. And so what I have here is the minima found was zero. Uh, there was only one of that minima found. So it was only found the one time. Uh, I, I found 17 minimum uh, with uh, six different values. Yeah. This is just a little summary of me to, to check what it is I can actually look deeper. The maximum value was 2.04. Uh, it was found four times by four different searchers. May not be the same point, but that value was found four times. There was 18 points that were found, six different values. Okay, so that means there was some things that were found twice. If I did unique, uh, you know, I can constrain things so they'll only be found once. Uh, but I look, at the so I look at the log that gets dumped out, and the log that gets dumped out, and you, here is the now this was done in parallel too, but the log uh, shows that all of it converged kind of quickly and then uh, there was these long tails. So if I wanted to run it even less, I, I mean I can go back and change the optimizer so I can truncate over a certain number of steps and save myself some computation time. But you can see I had good convergence. These are fast solvers where they're just basically looking for a minima to get stuck in. And you can see they all found roughly uh, the same value. Uh, and the surface we were looking at was the uh, Greewank surface, which basically looks like that. And when we plot it with the, the log here and plot it with the uh, inverse, uh, which was, so these are the all the minima trajectories and these are all the maximal trajectories. You could see that all the blue points, there's a number of these solvers that hit the, the blue points on the minima. They're just randomly dropped in space, and they converge to the all the minima. And you could see the same thing uh, for the red points and the maxima. They're all hitting the maxima. Now, what you have from that is uh, which I'm which I'm not showing, but there's an example in the Mystic uh, repository that uh, that says, given these points, given these points, uh, interpolate a surface. So what that says is, if you have something that's very expensive, you kind of find the things you're interested in, the minima, the maxima, the turning points, uh, and from that you can 
uh, interpolate a surface and get uh, an analytical solution to something potentially very, very expensive. Uh, and then use that analytical solution to do, uh, to do your analysis, the interpolated solution to do your analysis on. And that way you can, on the cheap, do a lot of optimization on something that approximates your model pretty well. Okay, so I think, uh, I think that hits our time. Uh, so uh, I, uh, I'll take any quick questions that you guys have. You can always, uh, again, um, uh, look for the solutions a little bit later in the day, and uh, I will, uh, I'll happily, I, I'm very active uh, if you, if you want to hit me up on, uh, on, uh, on GitHub or, or, or send me an email. I'm happy to respond to the people in the class. Thanks.